Hey everyone! Hi! Welcome to the OWASP DevSlop show! Um, today with me I have Nancy Garishe and I have Oren Thomas. DevSlop show! Oh! Um, today that is me. me! I have Nancy Garishe and I have... Shh! Quiet, Tanya! Oh yeah, I'm Tanya Janka. Hi! <laughs> uh, so this is part of the OWASP DevSlop project. So OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project, and Nancy and I are two of the project leaders of that open source project where we learn about how to add security through DevOps. And so we're called DevSlop because we're sloppy DevOps, and we are just learning as we go and sharing everything we learn. Oren is with us today because he is a Microsoft Security Azure guy. He is a cloud advocate. He works where I work. And he knows the answers to things that I don't know, so he's like backup for me. <laughs> Nancy, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and say hi? Well, a quick hello to everyone. I'm Nancy Garishi. Um, well, I'm one of the project leader for the OWASP DevSlop uh, project, and I'll be assisting Tanya and Oren today, and I'll be on chat on Twitch, Mixer, and um, YouTube. So ask your questions there, and I'll try to help. Awesome. Oren, would you like to give yourself a little bit of a intro and tell people a bit about you? Hi, my name's Oren Thomas. I'm Australian by the accent. Uh, I work with Tanya at Microsoft. Um, I was a security MVP for about 12 or 13 years before I came to Microsoft. And um, if you've got any questions, um, I'll be answer answering them in the Zoom group chat. Thank you. Awesome. Sass. So the first thing that we need everyone to do is make sure they have their Azure trial set up because it's going to be very boring for you if you don't have any Azure happening because you won't get to do very much. So I'm going to add this. Um, how do I add this in the chat window? I don't know how to add this in the chat window. I'm going to stop my share for a second and then add this to the chat window so that you can share it on. So I shared it on Twitch. But like my Twitch, hey Nikki, what's up? Nicole's joining us. Yes. Yay. All right. Nicole is also part of the OWASP DevSlop project. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with Nancy, and then we are going to start off our workshop. And so it's going to start with slides for a little bit. And I'm going to assume that all of you have your trial set up. So you all have the link now. Oh, I'm going to put you guys to the side. No offense intended. There you go. You look great there. <laughs> okay, so all of you hopefully have your trial set up so that you can participate. If you don't, start now so that you can participate by the time we get to that step. All right. So stay. So this is a cloud native security workshop and all of our demonstrations are going to be in Microsoft Azure. There's a whole bunch of different clouds. Uh, there's three main ones that take up like the big part of the market. There's GCP by Google, AWS by Amazon, and Azure by Microsoft. And so I work for Microsoft, so spoiler alert, I talk about it a lot. Um, and so I'm going to explain what cloud native means, and we're going to talk about different ways that you would secure that. And then we're going to do exercises together to make sure we know how to do a good implementation. All right. So today, we're going to talk about cloud, what cloud native is, what cloud native security looks like, and then we're going to show you examples in Azure. In case like my previous intro wasn't enough, now you have like pretty picture. All right. So I want to warn you all right now that I'm going to expect you to participate uh, in, oh, this is much better having it at the top. Um, I'm going to expect you to participate in this workshop. The way the workshop's going to go is first we're going to turn on Security Center and then we're going to add a template into your Azure subscription. And then we're going to talk a lot for a while about what the differences are between a traditional data center and how that security works versus how cloud security works. Um, and we're doing that, one, because that's an important topic, but two, we're also counting down time while the templates go into your Azure subscription. So 
a really nice member of the community wrote up some ARM templates, which means Azure Resource Management, and it just automates a bunch of stuff. At the end, I'm gonna share a bunch more that this really excellent individual made. So you can do a whole bunch of things for the entire length of your Azure subscriptions. So you can check out like, oh, was it like with endpoint security? Was it like without endpoint security? How do I block viruses? How do I block cross-site scripting, etc.? With the idea that you can continue learning on your own after this. But I am going to expect people in the chat to participate. I am a meanie. So I am hoping that Nancy and uh, Nikki and Oren during this time will tell me things that are in the chat and I know that there's a delay but we'll do our best. I've never done this over the internet before, I've just done it live a bunch of times. Okay, so, so this is me. Um, this is also me, I'm Tanya Jenka, which you can't see because uh, beautiful images of us are covering it but I don't know where else to put us. On the internet I'm known as GX Purple. I work at Microsoft. I'm a developer advocate. Um, I'm totally obsessed with OWASP. Uh, I'm one of the many founders of WOSEC, Women of Security, and I am part of the OWASP DevSlot project group. So this is my About Me slide. I hope this makes you feel that I'm very qualified to give this workshop. Yes, next. Okay, so now we're gonna set some stuff up. This part is gonna be the most boring part. I'm sorry, but sometimes you have to do boring stuff to get to the good stuff. So the first thing we want to do is we want to turn on Azure Security Center. Azure Security Center, or ASC as we affectionately call it because we say it so many times, internal. Um, it is basically a giant dashboard where you can see all of the security things. By default, it's not necessarily turned on or it's turned on but it's on the low community free version. We want to turn it on to the um, we call it standard version, but basically it's the one that you pay for. However, you're doing a free trial, so it's free. Caution, if you are using your work subscription, this will turn it on at work. That could potentially cost some money. This is why I gave away free trials. If you are doing this with your work subscription, if you have already used your trial for Security Center, that means that you will have to pay for Security Center. And so I would advise against doing that because I don't want you to get an unexpected bill that's not fun. If you are using a trial, it's free. If you are using your work subscription and you know for a fact that they've never used the free trial for Azure Security Center, fill your boots. That, that's Canadian for go do it, it's okay. But, <laughs> yeah. But the, Thanks but, for translating. <laughs> but the point is, is None of us want you to get a bill you're not expecting. We don't want you to ever get a surprise bill that you're like, oh no. And while I think you should definitely use this amazing tool, I don't think you should get billed for it as a surprise. So don't turn on Security Sensor for your entire enterprise because you might be very unpopular when your bill comes in. Okay, do you feel that warning was reasonable? That was good. Do you feel it was ambiguous at all? No. Okay. I'm slightly terrified. Okay, good. Awesome. <laughs> good. Okay. So now let's turn it on. So I made a video of how to turn it on because I don't want to turn it off. Like as an employee, I'm not allowed turning it off because it protects like Microsoft stuff, right? Um, so I've made a video. So this is what your dashboard looks like or your, um, not your dashboard, your portal, your Azure portal looks like. And so we're going to click play. So you go over here on the left down to Security Center and you open it, it will probably just pop up and tell you that you should subscribe. But if not, click on subscription coverage and you have subscriptions that are not fully protected. We want to be in the standard coverage. You're not going to be there by default. So we click the purple upgrade button now and you see my trial was already used. Your trial will not be used. If your trial is already used, this is where money comes into play. Don't turn it on for your enterprise. So you click the upgrade button like I did, and then it takes a minute. It takes a little while, and then it's gonna take a little while again to see all of your resources and to know what's going on. And that's why we're turning it on right away. Um, so this is again, just to show to check to make sure that you've turned on. So you go back to Security Center, which is here on the left. You click overview, you click subscriptions and then hopefully you see yourself here in the standard coverage. This is where you want to be. 
Ta Janka, that's me. Roll set. Do you think I should play that again? How are the users doing? No questions, but maybe one more time. Yeah, let's play it again. It's only one minute and we have lots and lots of time. I sh you know what? I have a link to this on the internet, which maybe I could share. It's on the SheX Purple YouTube page, um, but let's just play it again. Okay, so on the left here at the bottom is Security Center by default. You go into Overview and then you go to Subscription Coverage. Then you click the Upgrade Now button. You might have the Upgrade Now button available on your main page. We really want you to turn it on. <laughs> Just click the beautiful purple button with the rocket. Make sure it does not say your trial has already been used, right? Because then it's $15 per, per actually I'm gonna pause this for a second. So if you have a subscription that only has one virtual machine, it would be $15. That's how much it would cost. But if you turn it on for an enterprise and let's say you have like 500 virtual machines, that could be quite pricey. Do you have a question, Nancy, from the... Yes, I do. Uh, Indigo Purse 2557 is asking, um, it's asking if I want to install agents manually or not. Do we install it, continue without installing agents? Okay, so an agent is installed on um, resources that are in your Azure subscription, but that weren't created by Microsoft. So let's say you copy a virtual machine in, it needs to have an Azure agent on it, an Azure Security Center agent on it in order to monitor it. So if you were doing this permanently, yes, like a professional installation, you would definitely absolutely want to install those agents. But for this workshop, I don't think you should because then you're installing something that's potentially in production and uh, I want to not mess with anyone's stuff. It's better for me and less stressful for me if I know everyone's using a trial but I don't always get to have the things I want because a lot of people have already used their trial, which is cool. And then you're using your real subscription. I just don't want anyone to pay extra fees they weren't expecting. And uh, the user added, just for context, this is on a fresh new install of oh. Azure subscription. So there are no other VMs. Oh, then yes, we would want to install the agent. Why wouldn't the agent be installed by default or in any thoughts on this? Are you muted? Not installed by default is that uh, Microsoft is very concerned about unusual, uh, well, basically people being billed for things that they have necessarily explicitly agreed to. And that's actually the reason that why we don't enable Azure Security Center by default. Because yeah. if we were being uh, very, if we were insanely security focused, but, you know, very um, top down about it, we'd actually turn this on by default. We wouldn't give you a choice. We'd actually have all of these features lit up, but you would be charged. So the balance is that a, po a policy decision was made that you actually have to go and turn on as your security center because there's customers out there who don't want to be charged for anything other than what they've specifically chosen. So yeah. if I was running it, I would just build in as yeah. your security center as mm -hmm. part of your Azure subscription cost yep, because I think that you should be aware of all of the recommendations about what's wrong with your configuration. But a decision was made somewhere at Microsoft at some point in time that, you know, from a policy perspective, you have to go and turn these things on. So, yeah. you know, that's basically the reason that these sort of things are done. Okay, so then, yes, install the agent if this is a fresh a subscription then definitely do it i'm surprised it's not installed by default though maybe this is a thing that has changed since i started my subscription are there any other questions that you, anyone sees in the chat well i see um that your the screen seems to be different for some of them uh, mad plat sets my dashboard looks different but it should be fine and then yeah our screen looks different than yours okay Hmm. I did record this video this winter, so maybe it has changed since then. Is yeah. anyone having trouble? The main thing that I care about is that is everyone okay with upgrading it to the standard coverage? Like if we go uh, to, where is the part in the video where, is everyone okay with getting to the standard coverage? Because that's the thing that we want. Yeah. 
No question about that. I think we're good for this. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. You're all great. Sorry, I'm crooked. There's like a lot of things plugged into my computer on the side, so I can't put it on my lap. Okay, so now let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to do something called loading an ARM template. This is going to get really, um, this is probably going to annoy a bunch of you. This seems to be the most complex part for whatever reason, even though it's, it's pretty easy, but I find that a lot of people just get one of the settings wrong and then it's upsetting. So I made a video load ARM of how to load a, an Azure resource manager template, but let's just show you. Okay, so we're only going to load one of these labs. But I'm going to share three more later in the workshop in case you want to continue to do cross site scripting and, you know, do, um, you know, uh, uh, sorry, um, like look at a security standpoint, like with endpoint protection versus not and see if you can get past things, how to detect viruses, etc. So there's a whole bunch of different ones, but the one we're going to use is called SQL injection attack. So if you put in this short link, so I'm gonna share this in the chat. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Um, oh no, okay, so now it's opening it. I don't know if you all can see that. Wait, wait, uh, Z. so copy, and how do I, I think I have to stop sharing. I think I have to stop sharing in order to uh, stop share so that I can go to the chat. That's really weird, I can't go to the chat without, Whatever, it's okay. So I shared it in your chat and I'm gonna share it in my chat. Oh, will we touch Sentinel at all? No, um, Tim, Tim bot, Timbo twitched. Uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna touch Sentinel in this, unfortunately. Yeah, there's only so much we can do and um, the Sentinel team has some pretty cool stuff. Maybe I could have them on, that would be pretty neat. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to this and then I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to try to share my screen. This is going okay. Okay, um, second, where are you? There you go. So I'm going to share with you again. Share. Okay, is everyone okay with seeing my screen again? Right yeah, no, my side. Okay, all right. So I'm going to move all of you, all y'all up. Maybe I could put you down the side here. This, there we go. Okay, so we want to open this link and then there's going to be a button. See the button here, deploy to Azure. We're gonna click that button. And then here are the instructions. So we're going to add it to our resource group. And this is, I feel like our little visuals are in the way. Sorry, we're over there now. Okay, so we're going to add this template into a resource group. We're going to create a new resource group. We're going to choose our location. I'm going to do this with you. I'm telling you what we're doing in advance, and then we're going to do it together. We're going to enter a username and password. We're going to check I agree, and we're going to click purchase. It's going to be free if you are using an Azure trial, because all the things are free. If you're using your own subscription, installing a virtual machine costs money, not very much and we will boot it down and tear down all the resources after this workshop to make sure that you don't get a large bill. But again, okay, I feel like I've given a lot of warnings. Okay, so this is what the forum's gonna look like. So location, um, all of this, I agree and purchase. But I'm gonna go out of here and I'm just gonna do it all with you. So if we come over here, this is where the short link is gonna take us to and then we're gonna click deploy to Azure. Azure templates are so great. Resource management templates are wherever, ARM templates are so helpful. I had to make a talk for the Microsoft Ignite tour and I used templates and then that meant whoever did my talk just set it up like this. So let's create, so you pick your subscription. It should be there by default if you have a professional subscription make sure you are picking your personal one then we're going to create a new works a new resource group so a resource groups kind of like um i don't know imagine a tupperware container you put all the stuff in there 
And then the idea is you could throw the Tupperware container away and every single thing in it gets thrown away. So we're gonna create a little space within Azure to put stuff and I'm gonna name mine DevSlop Workshop, which seems like a good name. So I, it's gonna create new. My location, you wanna pick a location that's close to you. So I'm gonna pick East US because that's close to where I am. I'm currently located in uh, Ottawa, Canada. We're really close to it, <laughs> just across Actually, the river. One hint with trial subscriptions is that trial subscriptions will be aren't preferenced like other subscriptions. So sometimes when you're deploying from a trial subscription and you're spinning up resources like VMs, you might actually get a warning saying that you can't deploy the template simply because obviously paying customers are preferenced over trial trial customers. So I find, for example, I like to deploy in uh, Southeast Asia, which is the Singapore data center, simply because that tends to be a data center that doesn't have as much resource contention. Some of the North American data centers are under resource contention, which means that if you are deploying resources into a trial subscription there, sometimes you won't be able to get the VM sizes you want or the resources you want. So sometimes it can be difficult to actually see that error. So if you're trying to deploy something and it doesn't work, maybe change the region. And again, I would suggest trying Singapore or Southeast Asia is where I would start from because I've seen that less often than not. But yeah. I've certainly been in like, situations where students have tried to deploy something and it's like, why can't I deploy my VM? And it's like, well, Western Europe was used, working yesterday, but not working today. That's a great tip. Thank you. I did not know that. So see, everyone learns on the DevSlop show. So I, I am going to pick, um, so again, for my location, so it's going to ask again my location um, because I think because it's also making a database. And then I'm going to click East US again, so they both go the same place. Leave these things as default. We do not need a SAS token. Now for SQL administrator name, we're going to pick DevSlop. We are all going to be named DevSlop. And our password for everyone is going to be capital P A S S W O R D one two three four. So password one two three four. Let me create. Now we want to reiterate that there's a reason that we've chosen an unusual administrator name and a specific password. That is that Azure actually has a whole lot of requirements around what you can and what you can't use as a password. And if you go and throw your own thing in there, maybe it'll work but maybe it won't because some of these templates don't do all of the checking that they need to actually do. So even though we've given you some a, a crappy username and password, and of course you're going to be blowing these resources away later, the reason that we've actually chosen these ones, if, for example, if you try admin or something like that, it's not going to work because there's a restricted uh, sorts of names that you can actually use for things. And there's also password requirements around length. So the only reason what we're telling you to do this is that we have seen this sort of all fall apart and yep. you know catch fire because people have gone, oh, well, that's just a stupid password. I'll put my own in and then gone to deploy and then half an hour later they're going, why isn't this working? It's not working because you know something failed ungraciously in the background. Yes, what Oren said, all of that. <laughs> um, so, so please use these. This is an awful password. We all agree you should never choose this in real life but this is for fun and this is a learning experience and we are gonna change this later. Well, we're gonna delete this later. So it's okay in this one instance, don't do this at work. <laughs> so then we're gonna click okay. And then we're gonna click the purchase button. Is everyone, does everyone seem okay, Nancy? Does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna just check on my side before, cause then that screen's gonna disappear. Everything seems fine on my side. Wonderful, awesome. So I'm gonna click the purchase button. We're all gonna click the purchase button. And then assuming no error immediately comes back, if there's an error, we'll talk about it. So this is what you wanna see. Deploying to resource group, DevSlop workshop is in progress. This is gonna take like 15 minutes. And so we're gonna do some slides and discussion. Just a quick question. Uh, when users see two sus subscriptions to choose from, does it matter? They are named the same, but they have different UUID. Oh, that's weird. Um, would this person have a professional account as well? So one is for work, and then one is their, their new one that is with the trial? 
Hercules, please answer. That is what has happened, is that they've actually registered uh, a trial subscription using their um, the same, basically, credentials. Now, the problem with that, or the challenge with that, is that it'll be linked to the same as your Active Directory instance as well. Mm. Um, one of, another piece of advice I have for people setting up trial subscriptions is always go and create a brand new Outlook.com or Hotmail account and use that for each new trial subscription. Never ever go and use an account that you've already used to sign up to Azure for because the moment you do that, it will associate it with your existing Azure Active Directory instance, which can be fine in some cases, but can lead to a whole lot of confusions. Trials should be very much fire and forget you're using them. You blow them away. So you go and create a dodgy or just a basic account, go and set it up. I'd also suggest turning on multi-factor authentication for your uh, throwaway account because sometimes they do look suspicious and your trial might actually suspect, be suspended if you're using it over concurrent days. But that will save you a whole lot of grief, especially if you're doing any interaction whatsoever with Azure Active Directory. And that seems to be the case. He says, I have two accounts, one personal and one business. Mm. Um, okay, so it would be a different email address. But you, you need a different credit card, I think, as well, if you're, you're using a different email address. Probably. No, you get a certain number of activations uh, from a particular phone number and a particular credit card. It's not infinite. Oh. Um, and it also does need to be a credit card. It can't be a debit card. But uh, as long as it, you know, general, I think it's somewhere around five uh, that you can do five trial subscriptions before you need a new credit card number. And then within about 18 months, that'll actually be reset for you as well. Oh, good to know. If we're loading insecure things. So I don't think it's a good idea that they would load that into work stuff. I don't think that, like, even if they're putting it in a separate subscription, I don't like it. Sorry. Like, it's one thing for it, because they can just not load the template, and then we can still do all the other steps, if that makes sense, because we can still, like, turn on a bunch of stuff and protect a bunch of things. But, yeah. It feels like a bad idea. <laughs> It's okay? Got it. Informed. <laughs> okay, cool. So let's go back to our slides. So now we're at the slide portion of uh, the presentation where I'm going to need help from Nancy and Oren and Nikki with the, um, with the chat. So we've already done this. So we've implemented this. We're, we're adding currently the Azure Resource Management template to our subscription, that's gonna take a while. So we're gonna do a couple slides and learn stuff. And I'm hoping that some of the audience is willing to actually participate because otherwise it's not as fun for me. <laughs> Orin's just like shaking his head. Okay, so what is cloud, right? So. I want to just define it for everyone, even though a bunch of you are probably like, oh, we already know this. Not everyone knows. And sometimes um, I've asked people if they know what cloud is, and then their answer is something that is not what cloud is. Like they're like, yeah, you can share photos there. I know, I have an iPhone. I have got that answer from someone whose job was to teach computer science in high schools. And that's what they thought the whole cloud was, a place where you were allowed to share photos from your iPhone. So let's talk about what cloud, cloud's more than just that. Don't get me wrong, sh sharing your photos is, a, is fun. Okay, so according to Wikipedia, cloud computing is on-demand availability of computer system resources. So that means I can just spin up a virtual machine and some other person is managing all the computers and everything else around that. I don't have to do that, I don't have to go down to you know, Best Buy and buy a server and turn it on and plug it in somewhere. This just magically happens over the internet. So it, it's the on-demand availability of computer system resources, especially data storage and computing power without the active management by the user. So I don't have to rack servers. Yes. Um, I don't have to figure out air conditioning. For instance, my laptop's really hot right now because I'm recording this and I'm streaming it and I'm streaming out to 
Nancy and, and Nikki and Oren all at the same time and my computer is just pretty active, right? So what's happening for the workshop is actually all up in the cloud, which is awesome because then I don't have to do any of it. So what is cloud native then, right? So cloud is all this on-demand stuff and someone else is managing it. So what do you do with it? So cloud native, my, my definition is stuff that is designed specifically to run in the cloud. <laughs> stuff that you can do that's different that you can't do in a traditional data center. But let's look at a more adult and professional definition. So it's applications and services that automate and integrate the concepts of continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, DevOps, or DevSecOps, as we like to call it, microservices, serverless, and containers. Nancy, do you feel like it's uh, too much if I go into explaining each one of those? No, I think yeah. it's, it's useful, especially we have some time, yes. Okay, perfect. Because I gave this at iHack on Saturday, and it was all students, and I was like, yes! <laughs> Much new stuff. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so continuous, and a lot of people will say, oh, a CI, CD pipeline, and they kind of use the terms continuous integration, delivery, and deployment as though they're the same thing, and I'm just going to briefly differentiate. So continuous integration is the idea that you are constantly checking your code into the trunk, to make sure that it integrates and works with all the other code. I have worked at many a place where I will have a junior developer who will disappear and be suspiciously quiet for a few weeks, and then they come back and they're like, guess what, Tanya? I made this amazing new feature, and they check it in, and then everything the rest of us have done for the last six weeks is broken. <laughs> and so if instead you check in things regularly, um, then you don't break things as often. There's smaller risk because there's smaller changes, and so that's continuous integration. Then continuous delivery is the idea of automating that. So that's using a pipeline, right? And so you don't generally, you can do continuous integration manually, but it works better with a pipeline. Automation is awesome. That's why we all learn to code Python because you want to automate the boring stuff. That's why you learn how to code everything. Um, and so then continuous deployment is where, so you have this pipeline, you're checking things in often, you have lots and lots of tests, and you're so confident in your tests that then after a change is made, it automatically releases to prod. So it just deploys out to prod continuously. Um, places like Etsy, uh, I believe Netflix, I believe Microsoft, a lot of uh, companies do that that are very, very, very confident in their pipelines and the level of testing that they have automated. They still do manual testing, they still do a bunch of other things, but they are doing such small changes so regularly that they feel very confident in this. Okay, so DevOps. DevOps is our favorite thing in this project, and uh, I define it as the same way as the DevOps handbook. Everyone has many different ways that, um, some people are like, oh, that's where you, you hire one person, and then you make them do dev, and you make them do ops, but they just get one paycheck, it's the best. So that's not what a lot of people feel DevOps is. <laughs> it's more like a different way of creating software with the, idea, with the idea that you're trying to accomplish three things. The first thing is the idea of uh, releasing things as quickly as possible and making sure that you emphasize the efficiency of the entire system rather than just your part. So you often you use CI CD pipelines so that you can automate boring things and make things more efficient and faster. Then the second thing, the second way, is that you need feedback all the time. You need feedback as quickly as possible. I don't want to hear one year later, like with Waterfall in the past, which when I was younger um, and earlier in my career, that was what everyone did. Uh, then they came up with Agile where they did smaller circles and, and did things like releases slightly more often, but still not very often. But the idea now with releasing very often and running lots of automated tests is that you get feedback right away. So then the third way of DevOps is the idea of continuous, continuous risk taking, experimentation, and most of all learning. And so that's the third way is what we're doing with OWASP DevSlop. We are 
fumbling our way through learning and experimenting and constantly trying new things to see if they work for us. And the third way is the part that we're working on the most. Okay, so the next thing is microservices. So a microservice just is like software that does one single thing for you. Um, so let's say you want to just, uh, someone puts in their postal code and then it looks up the rest of their address for you. So all the service does is take postal codes and sends back everything else to you except the house number. And then the user has to fill in the house number themselves. So this would be a service. It just does one, a microservice does one single thing. It doesn't do a whole bunch of things. You create separate services for each thing. And the reason you do that is because then if one service goes down, the rest of your app still functions well. So you have many, many different pieces that make your application run. If one is down, life's still okay, ideally. And then you can spin that service back up. Okay, the next one is serverless. People will say that's where you run stuff without a server. Well, that's technically true. <laughs> uh, most people uh, would define it as, um, so in Azure it's called Azure Functions, in AWS it's called Lambda. And the idea is, is it will run a script for you and it just does that action and disappears. So you don't have to maintain a virtual machine or a container or anything, you just call it and your cloud provider will spin up on the spot a container run your little bit of code and then exit out and kill that container so that it costs you like a cent, one penny or something like that to run a service as opposed to if you are running a virtual machine all the time, that can cost 20, 30 bucks a month, right? So instead, let's say this just runs two times a week. Instead, perhaps your bill could be 25 cents for the month. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the last one is containers. So. <laughs> A virtual machine is an operating system running um, virtually, as opposed to it being on what we would call bare metal back in the day. So you would buy a server and you would install Windows directly onto that machine. Now, instead, we're like, oh, I wanna run Windows and Linux. So you could have two virtual machines running at the same time. But you still need a whole bunch of RAM to run those operating systems, and you still need a whole bunch of hard drive space because operating systems are gigantor. And what a container does is it just runs the tiny, tiny bit of the operating system needed to do the thing that you're trying to accomplish. And um, Nicole built, uh, Nicole built um, these containers for Pixie, and they're so teeny tiny, they're so small. So we used to do a different workshop with a virtual machine, and it was four gigs. We had to run out and give everyone USB keys. But then we started doing things with Pixie, and because she's so tiny and little, I think she's, I don't know, a couple meg. And so then people could just download it from GitHub and we could get going. Because so you don't need as much operating system and stuff. They do less. Okay, good. Hey. Good. Great. Hey, Nikki, how you doing? Hey. Good, I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm trying to uh, not contribute vocally so much. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. We're glad you're here. Yeah, same here. Hey, Nancy. Hello, Nikki. Happy to see you. Well, hear you. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to see me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Poor. Okay. Uh, I do have a few questions yeah. while uh, you were talking. And yeah. That. Um, well, question or comment. Um, Mad was saying that he gets a DB error, but let's see. Mm. He didn't come back with anything, so I'm not sure. If it's still an issue, Mad, please let us know. Matt, was your password n not with an upper, a lower, a number, and then 12 characters? Because Azure can be a little sneaky with this ARM template where it silently fails. So this is why we made the really dumb password of capital P password 1234, because it always passes the password test. And whenever I used to let people just make their own passwords, every time it would not go well. If this has happened to you, delete your resource group and start from the beginning and do the same thing again and it'll be fine. But it will take you a little while to delete and I know that's annoying, I'm sorry. We're okay? Any other Good. questions? Nope, that's just for now. Um, well, he said the first time I did that error but created a second one with yours and the same thing. But they'll try again. Oh no. Probably. He's not giving up. Thank you for not giving up, Matt, and I'm sorry that things are being wonky. 
There is a question in Twitch about APIs. Okay. The question is, are APIs microservices themselves? Um, I guess I it... took a stab at answering it. I guess it depends on how small they are. <laughs> it, yeah. An API is an application programming interface, and the idea is, is that you can call it, and it will go to a service for you. However, some of them are really big and do like a lot of stuff, and I wouldn't really call that a microservice. Um, but, yeah. but I still think maybe APIs should be a part of this definition. I think I should add yeah. it. And they're they're more like the connective tissue that connect the microservices. That's how I like to think of them. Yes, that's such a good way of explaining it too. Um, do we have any more questions? We're doing okay. All right. Next slide. So what is the difference between cloud and a traditional data center? So there's going to be a couple of things that are different. So first we're going to talk about just generally what the differences are. Then we're going to talk about the security differences. And then hopefully all of our Azure templates have loaded. Yes. Okay. So this is where I would like some audience participation. So what do you think of when you think of a traditional data center? Uh, anyone's allowed answering. So I'm going to give you some answers after, but I really like it when the audience gives me some answers first. So if you walk into a data center, what is the first thing you will notice? Hopefully security stopping you from walking straight into the data center. Yes, physical security. That is right, Oren. <laughs> also? Server racks. Yes, yes, and so, so many cables. <laughs> what else? What else do we think of when we think of a traditional data center? See, when I can see the audience in person, I like to stare at people awkwardly <laughs> until they answer, but also I give them candy as bribes. So I feel like... Oh. It and about the host wants a lot of candies. <laughs> she says, traditional data center, fixed computing limits, lots of infrastructure maintenance, huge upfront costs. Yes. Uh, I got lots of network cables, too many sleepless nights, <laughs> installing, <laughs> installing operating systems, and expensive real estate space, yes. power consumption, etc. That's a good list. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That person gets all the candy. <laughs> that person should message us after and I'll send them some stickers because that was great. Don't let me send everyone stickers. I'll, I'll go broke. But that person deserves stickers. Okay, so let's go through a list. Manual patching and patch management. So you can send stuff out with System Center to do some patching, but you can't just tell which ones are missing the patches. You have to go and check things out and sometimes patches fail and you have to manually apply them. Sometimes you have to touch every machine. It's what my manager Steve calls it, where uh, I remember when my government agency up upgraded to Windows 7 back in the day and we had to run around and like press next on every single computer. <laughs> mm -mm. So it's on-premises, which means it is your responsibility for good or for bad. Um, in traditional data centers, you can actually see the physical machines. You don't see anything in a cloud data center because you're not allowed in. You run your own network generally. So you have an intranet. And of all of the years of my entire career, of the times where the internet has gone down, one single time, the intranet was still up, so we had to stay at work, and it was such a boring day. <laughs> if you're a software developer and there's no internet, I mean, how am I going to go look up all the answers on Stack Overflow? Come on. So you are in charge of um, air conditioning. You're in charge of power, backups, everything. You are the boss of all those things. You need operations staff, and you need people on call, and that is money. You need to have an off-site business continuity plan or, and um, a disaster recovery plan. So your, I worked somewhere once in their, their business continuity plan, like they had their backups in the same data center. And I said, you mean like 
you mean like your hourly backups are there, right? But then you have your nightly backups offsite somewhere else, right? And they're like, no, why? I also worked somewhere once and we had a flood in our data center. And so that was a thing too. Um, so that's not good. Over provisioning. Does anyone want to tell me what over provisioning is? I think people want to tell me what over provisioning is. No. It's so hard because there's this 30 second delay and people feel shy. No one can tell it's you. You're on the internet. You're anonymous? Okay, fine. So over provisioning means you have to buy a whole bunch in advance in case you get bigger. So let's say you're planning a big event and you're thinking, okay, so, you know, I'm planning a, I don't know, a big party and I have this website and I think it's gonna get really big so I better buy like an extra server. But then if it doesn't get really big, then you just bought that server for nothing. Or what if it gets twice as big and you're so much more popular than you realize and your party's out of control and then your website just keeps going down because you didn't buy enough. So this is a thing with over-provisioning. And the last one is apps are deployed on specific servers. I used to name my servers. Um, I had Bessie, one of my servers that lived under my desk. Um, we used to have Scully and Mulder and they all had names because there was a physical one box where your app would be on. It's not how we do it now generally. So what do we think of when we think of cloud? So this is where I'm gonna, again, get the audience to hopefully answer some questions. Like, what do we think of when we think of cloud? So we just talked about a traditional data center with all the air conditioning and the freezing cold, it's loud, there's stuff everywhere. What do we think of when we think of cloud? How is it different? I think we need to wait a bit longer because with the delay, delay they, they answer a bit later. I know, I'm gonna yeah. be patient. I feel like I, I should tell dad jokes or something in the meantime, but. I don't wanna just like give them all away. <laughs> and Oren's laughing at me. <laughs> so Indigo Per says infrastructure is abstracted. Yes, yes, oh, that's so good. That's such a perfect way of saying it too. I'm gonna to copy it. <laughs> I'm hiding it. Um, oh. On demand, elastic, yes. automation, yes. adjustable compute, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You need maple candy and, and, and stickers for Indigo purse. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You keep that person's contact info. Yes. We'll, yes. Uh, they can send us a message on Twitch, I think. They could probably send uh, us. So over on YouTube, we've got uh, Borco saying separation of responsibilities, elasticity, self-service. And then Vain has said, no, thinking of manpower or woman power and provisioning is as required. Yeah, all of that is right. Yes. Okay, so let's go through my answers and see if we missed anything. So it's off premises, which means it's not your problem, which means you don't need to do physical security. You don't need to worry about if there's a flood. That is not, there's no building that you are paying for. Auto scaling, no need to buy in advance. All of you mentioned that, yes. Usually the cloud is internet available. So sometimes you can do, so Azure has Azure Express route. And I know the other cloud providers have something that does the same thing, but has a different name. Um, but generally, if you are a smaller company or a smaller consumer, you have to go through the internet to get to the cloud. And that means if your internet is down, you might not be able to get to your cloud and that's no good. So that's why we have direct connections. Infrastructure as a service. So usually I like to make the audience explain what this is, but Oren, would you like to explain what infrastructure as a service is? Sorry to put you um, on the spot. The, the way that most people think about it is the ability to just run, for example, VMs or traditional workloads within a cloud environment. It's the way that I guess is a practical definition of it. So. For example, within Azure or GCP or AWS, you can spin up a VM and it doesn't look any different to spinning up a VM that might be sitting on your local Hyper-V or VMware uh, server. Also, 
infrastructure as a service. We're going to talk about shared responsibility near the end, but if we spin up a Linux or a Windows VM for you, you have to patch it. If you don't patch it for a year and you get owned, that is not a thing that we are responsible for. Uh, someone came up to me at one of the Microsoft Ignite the Tours and he told me that was wrong. And he's like, I haven't patched any of my VMs in a year because Microsoft does it. And I was like, I need you to go back to your office and start patching right now. It's platform as a service that is not your responsibility. We handle, we as a service provide a platform that is secure. So for instance, the devswap.co website runs on an Azure app service and it is magically patched all the time and Nancy and I do not worry about it. Mm-mm because that's Microsoft's problem. <laughs> Thank you for handling that, guys. <laughs> yeah, so infrastructure as a service. You need to patch that. So apps can span different servers, and what this means is that if Bessie goes down, there's another app that could that it could just fail over to the other one. This is not a thing that could happen back in the day. I remember I broke a server. I may have set it on fire. With my testing, not physically, not violent, I just like crashed it 60 times in a row and it got really hot and it started smoking. My boss high-fived me. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> that was my co-op term. It's so great. Uh, but the point is, is like, now we can fail over to other servers. Your app doesn't just live on one server. It's somewhere in the cloud and you don't know where it is and that's nice. Maintenance is not your problem. You do not have to go and replace broken cables. None of you are wrapping cables anymore. Centralized management and visibility. So this is my favorite part. So in Azure, I can go and see what everything is and where everything is, like as much as I am allowed. So on my team, I am allowed seeing my subscription and I am allowed seeing the shared team subscription, which means I can go and add security things to them and tick off my team members. But I am not allowed seeing, for instance, uh, things internal to different product teams within Microsoft because I shouldn't. I have no need to know. But whoever is at the top, our real security team, not me, the advocate, they can see all of the things. And it's so nice because in a traditional data center, there is no beautiful dashboard that I've ever seen where I can actually see everything. Geo geographically distributed. What this means is if one of the data centers is really busy, you can just move could just go to the other one if you need to. You can have your stuff running in you know, Western Europe and then have it backed up every night in Asia. So that if there is you know, a huge, huge weather event that is really quite unfortunate and destructive, you're okay. Okay, Nancy, this is when I wanna ask people in the chat, what is lights out? What is a lights out data center? Because a lot of cloud providers are lights out and there are very few traditional data centers that are lights out. See, giving some time. One of the students yesterday, oh. okay, yeah? I got robot data center. Yes, it is a data center run by robots and do robots need lights? No, they do not. I got a no people. <laughs> yeah, no people. People are not allowed in the data center unless something really bad has happened. Mm -hmm. um, last summer, Azure went down, and it was because, like, one of the Azure data centers went down, and we uh, released, um, what's it called, a, um, a post mortem, and we explained that we were hit by lightning, which caused a flood within the data center, and we got hit by lightning again. <laughs> and everything caught fire. And guess what happens when plastic is on fire? Poison. Um, and no one was allowed in, right? And no one, no one is in in the beginning, so no one got poisoned. But you know, immediately staff were like, we need to go in. We're like, wait, no poison. So we had to wait until all the fires were out, all the airs were cleaned, and then we could go in and fix things. And so you only go into a lights out data center if a lot of bad things have happened. Do we feel good on this slide? Yeah, covered. Awesome. Good job, everyone. Okay, so here is a picture with a graph 
because I'm told people like those. And it says all the things that we just said, but in more professional words, you might want to save it. It's not mine. You can see at the bottom, uh, the it's by Quorum or Quora, Quora.com. But the point is, is like this is sort of a, a short form of all the stuff from those slides. But we're gonna, it's gonna be much more interesting in a second. So in case anyone wanted a screenshot, I hope you took one. Okay, next. Okay, now time for my favorite topic. <laughs> So let's talk about security, right? So now we are experts on the difference between a regular data center and the cloud. So what do you think of when you think of traditional data center security? So Oren mentioned physical security. So if you walk into a secured, uh, into a data center, there's gonna be some people with security guard written on their shirts saying, hey, whoa, whoa, where's your card, right? What else do we think of when we think of traditional data center style security. No answers at all? Answer. Okay then, I'm gonna tell you the answer. It's not gonna be as fun as you giving me the answer. I'll tell you, you're gonna be like, oh, that's anticlimactic, she just told us. <laughs> Still no answers? Mm -mm. Okay, well, S's. Okay, so zoning. Oh, oh, yeah. There was physical security, but we mentioned that. Okay. But good job, because that's correct. Yeah. So zoning. So back in the day, slash a lot of data centers still, we created this plan where, okay, so if we have different areas of the network, we should put firewalls around them. So that if someone gets in, they're only in that one area and then they're sort of trapped. So let's say you have all of your databases in the same zone and you have firewalls around it. What that means is if someone breaks into where your applications are, they'd have to break in again through another firewall to get to where your data is. However, it's kind of crappy because if someone does get into one of your zones, they can see everything in the zone because the idea is, is that you trust everyone that's in your area. So there's pros and cons. Traditional data center security, so you had to do some manual patching. I think this should say patch management. So you couldn't just see up to the date what was missing. If patches had or had not been applied, wasn't necessarily always obvious in traditional data centers. And because of all the zoning, sometimes it was really hard to see different parts. So usually you were required to use third-party scanning software in order to see uh, which configurations you had that were questionable, which patches were missing. Because sometimes you would send out a bunch of patches to everything and you know 99% of them would get applied successfully and some would just fail. And if you didn't read through all the logs, that patch would just never get applied. And I, in my previous role as a web app pen tester, would scan, would scan networks and find lots of patches wrong, lots of weird configurations. Like I remember on a load balancer finding Microsoft Office 2003 installed and I found that in 2016. And they're like, do you think we should patch it, Tanya? And I was like, no, are you writing short stories on your load balancer? You should uninstall that because that's not appropriate that that's there. And they would have never figured it out if it weren't for this third party software. So examples are Nessus, Nexpose, Nikto. There's a whole bunch of them. They're great. A lot of them start with N for network. So not only now do you have to maintain a trained operations team, but you also have to maintain a trained security team to handle security incidents around your data center. Um, on top of trying to buy Nessus, Nexpose, or whatever to scan for doing VA scanning, vulnerability assessment scanning, you also need monitoring tools, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention style tools, firewall tools. There's all sorts of third party security tools that you would buy and trying to make them talk is hard. Okay, so now let's talk about cloud native. So let's talk about what it is again. So it's applications and services that automate and integrate the concepts of DevOps, continuous delivery, integration, and deployment, microservices, APIs, containers, and serverless. It is not 
lift and shift. It is not copying everything from your traditional data center into someone else's data center and then saying, you know, the cloud really sucks. I mean, you can do that if you want to. It'll solve some problems for you, right? If you are having trouble scaling, it could solve that problem for you. You could take a really, really old app, put it in the cloud, put a WAF, a web application firewall around it, and put like some modern, um, modern native firewalls around it, and it will be safer than it previously was, and it will be able to auto scale. So you could fix a lot of your problems, but that's not cloud native, right? And I am not saying, oh, if you don't do cloud native, you're doing it wrong. I'm saying if you don't do cloud native, then you're just not going to get those those features, right? So um, it's a different way of doing things, uh, and it's it's harder but more exciting. Does that make sense? Like new stuff means we have to learn, but new stuff means we get to learn. Okay. So um, I was told that I didn't have enough pictures in this, so I added a dad joke. So you're pretty new to cloud storage, aren't you? As he tries to um, put his filing cabinet in the sky. I guess it's pretty bad, right? It's bad. So I did this presentation and then someone from Ottawa sent this to me and asked me to add it. So I did. But I think it's good because it breaks up, gives everyone a little break for a second. Okay, so now let's talk about cloud native security. <laughs> Nancy's like, it's so bad. Because <laughs> your, your dad jokes are usually better than that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's like a bad dad joke. <laughs> okay. It's okay. We can start with that one. <laughs> so, As the dad here, I'd like to say that some of, some of our jokes are sometimes a lot better than that. And some of us work at our jokes. But, you know. <laughs> Oren makes me laugh all the time at work. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No. Oh, no. I just gave away one of the answers. So what do we think? <laughs> what do we think of when we think of cloud native security? Okay, so I'm going to give you the first answer. So if we're doing things in a new way, if we're making new technologies, we need to secure them in new ways. And one of the new ideas that's very popular in cloud is a concept called zero trust. So before we would make zones and you would put, you know, all your data in this zone and then all your apps in that zone and then you put your load balancers in this zone. And then someone would get into the zone and they'd have access to everything. A lot of places also would um, assume that the perimeter was the only thing that they needed to protect. And so with the idea of zero trust is you don't trust anyone or anything by default. So let's say I have an app and it has a database. Well, we do have one, Nancy. And if you set up zero trust, the idea would be is that that database will only ever speak to that app and it will only ever speak to it with a service account. So we will use identity within our system. So we have an identity system that's for our whole cloud and it will have not Tanya's username and password, right? Because I'm the developer that made it. No, no, no. We will have a service account in between the two and that's the only way that it can talk to it. And then let's say that Nancy's our database administrator. So I would give Nancy's user account access to it and then nothing else should be able to access it. We close down all the ports. We'll talk about that. And just basically it doesn't trust anything else by default. It only talks to that app through that identity. And then Nancy is allowed to log in, open up the ports and do things if she needs to because she's our administrator. I can't go in. I shouldn't. I'm not the DBA. I'm the programmer, right? Or maybe I have right, uh, read only access. But the idea of zero trust is that don't trust anyone by default. And when you do this, that means if someone does break in, they just broke into one place and then they're stuck. And then they can't do a thing called pivoting. So I don't know if you've read the hacker's playbook, but oh gosh, it talks a lot about pivoting and that gives every security person nightmares. The idea of pivoting is they get into one place and then they're like, great, where else can I go on this network? And then they go all these other places that are in the zone and they find the weakest crappiest, oldest thing in that zone. They're like, great, I'm gonna break into there and I'm gonna hop over somewhere else. And they pivot around. That's not possible with zero trust. Every time you have to do a completely new break-in and that makes life very difficult, which is awesome for us, the good guys, gender neutral guys there. <laughs> okay, so what else do, has anyone give us, given us cloud native security ideas in the chat? No, but we have a, 
a question. Okay. How is a traditional service account different than a service principal name? Oh, okay. Oren, do you want to answer this? Because I, I see your eyes light up. I feel like it's the same. Um, so a service account is an account, obviously, for services. Uh, which doesn't so if you're running a service on a Windows box, you have an account which gives it an identity. So what you do is you set up what permissions that you want the service to have. It might be that you only want it to have a local user on the local machine. You might want to have it interact with the network, so you give it an ID that allows it to do that. So the other one was a service principal. A service principal is an account that you're allowing to go and do things within Azure. So you might. It, it, it is, whereas an account, a service account obviously runs on a Windows box, a service principle is something that runs in Azure. So there's certainly a bit of mapping between them. If you want a particular application to interact with other things on Azure, you assign it a service principle identity. You can't assign it a service account within Azure. So uh, if you want, for example, a virtual machine to interact with different things in Azure, or you can assign it a service principle and allow it to do it that way. Thank you. We lost our host. <laughs> so Tanya's run off. She's probably mugging someone for ice cream. <laughs> oh yeah, she did ask for ice cream break. She should have shared with us. Um, you, you think that she'd share the ice cream when she comes back too, you know? I mean, I'm not sharing the ice cream. I'm so mean. There will be an ice cream break, but not till later. That was more like a Tanya had too many glasses of water before the <laughs> workshop break. Did anyone else come back with That's any? That's a TMI break, isn't it? <laughs> We're allowed breaks. <laughs> did did anyone else come up with any other cloud native security concepts? Because I've got a whole another page worth that I'm going to give out, but I don't want to ruin anyone's thunder in the chat if someone is like me, me, me. Nope. Okay, I'm doing it. Well, there was role-based permissions and authentication, but. So those, I'm not sure if she meant for cloud native though. I feel like those are really good, important security concepts uh, and tools, but they're not specifically native to the cloud. Let's look at some, let's look at more of the list. Okay. So one of the things in Azure in order to achieve zero trust is called just in time access control, which is a thing that we're gonna do during our um, during our workshop activities. Um, so just in time closes all of the ports on your virtual machine and then you just flick one open specifically for your user and your IP only for a short period of time and then it closes it automatically. So I do that all the time on the virtual machine for our open source project. It's called DevSlop DCheck and it runs OWASP SAP, and I don't want anyone going in there and using it except us. So I flip open the port just for an hour or two hours or three hours. I RDP in, I do my administration, and then I close it up. And so the only other thing that can talk to it is our Azure DevOps pipeline. Automation in patching and patch management. So specifically with patch management. So Azure Security Center, does VA scans basically all the time, and it will tell you, assuming that there's an Azure Security Center agent installed on each one of your machines, it'll say, oh, did you know you're missing the security patch? You should probably patch it. Oh, did you know you have this configuration setting? We don't like it. We think this is a bad idea. And it does this constantly all the time so that you know what's up. So in the cloud, if you have the correct permissions, you can see everything, and that means you can monitor everything, and then that means you can add threat monitoring and threat protection. You can actually see everything. Um, I remember trying to install security tools in an old school data center, and just the hell of trying to get through all the different firewalls and stuff, it just made me really stressed out. Um, and so it's, if you were using tools that are native to your public cloud provider, they'll just magically work. It's so beautiful. It's so effortless compared to installing third-party tools and that is lovely. So I figured that everyone would get this one, DevSecOps, automation of security during the system development life cycle. That's what our show is about, Nancy. So, um, but I guess like maybe people feel that that's a little different, but 
Where is DevOps usually done? Quite often in the cloud. So monitor of everything. So because you can see everything, you can monitor everything. And in Azure, you can, and so like all the other cloud providers tend to do all the same things with different names. So when I say you do this in Azure, if you use a different cloud, you could probably do it there. But so we rate these things called playbooks, which means it, you're writing a bunch of serverless calls. And so if it recognizes certain behavior, it will run your playbook. So let's say it sees SQL injection. It's like, oh no, we know Tanya does not like that. We should run this playbook and then it will do the activities that you say in it. And so that might be phone Tanya. So Azure can phone you if you give it your phone number and it will tell you stuff. <laughs> like when it told on me to the Azure security team when I checked in a username and password into GitHub. <sighs> sharing secrets. Yeah, I was sharing secrets on purpose so that we could make our episode about it. But Azure did not want to share those secrets and it got very upset with me and it told on me to my boss. And then my boss thought it was really funny when I explained, but then it called the Azure Security Center like the real security team. And I, my name was Mud. Um, but it is cool that it told on me and this all happened within like a couple seconds. Like it was just so fast, the level of trouble I was in. But anyway, um, oh, do you have something to say? Well, just for automation of patching, it's a bit, uh, somebody was asking if um, we know if auto patching is available for, for containers as well in the cloud. I don't know. Oren, do you want to field this? I don't think so. I don't think so, generally, because uh, my, I mean, you want to automate your deployment pipeline or uh, however you do it with containers, because you'd be wanting to pull it an updated container one. image and then rebuild and then deploy using replace that yeah. way rather than going well i've got a running i mean the whole point of containers is that you don't treat them like pets you just blow them away so you just get a new container image and then whatever the script is to deploy your application within the container would automatically just rebuild using your docker file or whatever you're using to do that so not really uh, that's yeah yeah and for an app service like what we run nancy Microsoft patches it for us, they do everything. So it's just our virtual machine that we are in charge of patching, and that's only because OWASP Zap doesn't run in a container yet. I think that there's a Docker version um, that we, we should probably play with that. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. <laughs> Another thing on total visibility, a comment from Dart Ricks uh, regarding total visibility. I'm new to Azure. Total visibility is not cut and dry in my limited experience. There are so many ways to log and monitor yes. and different resources can send logs to things like Event Hub or audit logs, etc. So it seems not so straightforward. I think that I agree with him. <laughs> um, I will show you in Security Center what you can see. And for me, that is that is all the visibility that I would like. But I agree with you that there are a lot of different ways you can set up monitoring and also it kind of depends on if you decide you want to use some third-party tools or you use the cloud native tools because they all magically just click in together right because they're literally made by colleagues so they're supposed to work together but yes i agree with you total visibility means different things to different people and yes it depends on how you set things up also if for instance you are allowed to see all the things your teammates are doing or not for instance, when my boss was like, you are not the security team. No, you cannot have access to everyone's subscriptions in your security center. Pouty face. Um, the last one I'm going to say on here is um, because we can automate so many things with cloud native tools, once you have it set up, this means less incidents. So for instance, if you've seen a pattern before, you can write a playbook so it automatically responds to that which means instead of me getting a phone call in the middle of the night and I have to come in, instead this means I get an email in the morning because the playbook ran and then it worked and then they're like, here's the resolution of your thing. Or like, we blocked this attack. Don't worry, we got it. We just want to let you know that that happened. So less heroics means happier staff, which means less burnout, which means less employee turnover, which means less cost to your business. So that's the end of that page. Um, so now I want to talk about briefly 
why some people uh, don't want to move to the cloud. So a lot of people have a, um, like a lot of different feelings about public clouds and about trust. And this is a part of the workshop where I allow people to have kind of open discussion about you know, their feelings on that. And I know that that's kind of hard because it's in writing and we're filming and usually those things are not true. But I would like to give the audience a chance to bring up things that concern them in regards to this. And if they want, we could talk about it. Or Nancy Orrin or Nikki, if you have things that concern you in regards to trust, like when you think of moving your stuff to the public cloud, like what are your concerns? Let me go see first on the chat if there's anything. If people don't bring up things, I can bring up things from previous workshops, but usually I find that there's completely new ideas every time, things I hadn't thought of. I got one. Okay. The CPU bugs that have been just coming out one after the other over the last year. Mm. Oh my gosh, yeah, that scares me. Um, would everyone not be subject to that though, like traditional data centers and cloud, or is it more scary because it's multi-tenancy and there's just so many of us? Yeah, I think just like the, the, the overloading of multi-tenancy and a single or three cloud providers plus the CPU bug equal, could equal a disaster. Whereas in yeah. a data center, even if you have virtualization, it's your own, you're a single tenant in a virtualized world versus mm -hmm. strangers and, and your yeah that's a there's a lot of issues here i think it's beyond even just technical like you know maybe amazon's too big i don't know is it yeah like it is it uh, is it considered critical infrastructure like yeah, is, I don't know. is it the same as a like if the power companies go down that's really serious for the government right if if yeah. a public cloud goes down is that considered critical infrastructure after a certain point um, other issues that people have raised before is, you know, are the employees of the public cloud going to care as much as I do about protecting my own data? Like giving up control to someone else can be really difficult because you think you care the most, right? Um, insider threats, right? That's a problem at, that's a potential problem at any company. Ooh, Nancy, you just made a face. Yeah, there, yes, there's no control over location of intranet, i.e. corporate data, uh, could be on servers spied upon the host government. Um, and the Google Purse mentioned, and the concern is uh, the threat of subpoena seizing a cloud provider's multi-tenant system data. I think Nikki mentioned that as well, but differently. But uh, if there's a seizure, um, yeah, those are the two that were mentioned. Those are serious concerns. And we're allowed to have concerns and we're allowed talking about them. I feel like if we just pretend they're not there, that doesn't actually solve anything. And um, that means also that like the people providing these services don't know what to focus on and address first, right? If we don't know how everyone feels about things then we don't know how to fix those things. Are there any other things that people wanna share? Not about that. No. Okay, we're good. And now's the part where we do stuff because gosh darn it, definitely those templates should have gone into all of our subscriptions by now for sure, definitely. So mm -hmm. let's end the show, uh, the slideshow. And then I'm just going to briefly look to see if there's a, so of course I missed these things. I'm really sorry that I didn't go in to this one, but then I knew everyone would see my slides and they'd see all the answers. Um, so this is on the Shiax Purple channel. So will the cloud one day be in the sea? Actually, that's a real that's a real question because Microsoft did build um, a data center on the bottom of the ocean as an experiment because uh, the Azure data centers are gigantic. They're as big as a city. And that's a lot of land space where human beings could live instead. And also the biggest problem with data centers is cooling, right? And if you're on the bottom of the ocean, it's nice and cool there. So actually, they just might be. Um, yes, water cooling. So DevSecOps, just marketing or DevOps specialist with a focus on security? Okay, so um, 
I like to think of is dev DevSecOps is people performing AppSec in a DevOps environment. So people spe who specialize in securing software or doing SecOps, like the security of operations, working within a DevOps environment and how they have to change their behavior and activities so that they fit into the new environment. That's my definition. So our API calls a type of microservice. Oh, we already, we already got that. So trying to think forward, say 10 years, how might we further abstract all these different layers? Oh my gosh, if I knew the answer to that, I would get paid a lot more. Um, so API calls connect the microservices generally and they themselves can also be microservices. And then also just a bunch of dollar signs. Okay, good. <laughs> so I've covered that channel. Okay, great. So now let's go and do the stuff. So this is the workshop steps that we're gonna do. So we should have already all turned on Azure Security Center. The first thing I wanna go do is make sure it's turned on and just do an overview of what all the things are and step through it together. And then we're gonna go look at our app service and it kind of depends on how many people keep tuning in because if everyone hangs up on us, we won't get all the way to the bottom and that's okay. Um, I find usually everyone's brain melts after the two hour mark. So let's see how we do. Okay, so first of all, we are in Azure. This is what my Azure instance looks like. Is this big enough for everyone to see? Is that better? Is this okay for both of you? Hopefully the audience likes it. So your security center was probably at the bottom, but you can actually just drag it around. So I dragged mine to the top because obviously security should be top priority. <laughs> See, dad jokes, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna click on Azure Security Center and it's gonna load. And I don't know if you can tell, but it's getting dark here. So I'm just gonna go turn on some lights because uh, I'm in the Eastern Standard Time Zone right now and it's 8.22 and the sun's just about to set. So security center detected virtual machines without data collection agents installed. Oh, that must be what the people saw before. Hmm, that's interesting. So this must be something new. Whenever I do a demo in Azure Security Center, it's exciting because there's new stuff that I did not know about. You would think I would know, but I don't. It is also a surprise for me in a good way and in a bad way. So let's all click on the overview tab right here. Uh, I'm, no offense, I'm gonna move both y'all over here again. Um, so when we look at the, the overview, we can see there's three main sections and I want all of us to go through and check this out. So first of all, we're gonna fold this in. If you need to interrupt me, Nancy, you can. You're muted. Better, yes. Um, if I got two people to have failures on their deployment. So I keep getting a failure on my deployment. I got a conflict error for one, for the SQL injection web app resource. And mm -hmm. another user, at least one resource deployment operation failed as well. So what kind of information would you need to help? Or is that enough? Um, I think that they should try deploying it again and see if it worked. Oren, do you have any ideas? Because basically I, I think there was a follow-up comment that the resource group is in a location that's not supported by one or more resources in the template. So what oh. they might need to do, they might have hit that subscription issue and they might actually need to deploy in a different data center. Uh, it might, and again, I always say try Southeast Asia, see if it works there. Okay, so delete your resource group and everything in it. And you'll have to modify the template to deploy in or the, yeah, the deployment properties to deploy in Southeast Asia, try that. 
So let me show you how to find your resource group. So we click over here on the left on resource groups. So we click there and then you will likely just have one because you only have one subscription. And then you would click on, oh, DevSlop Workshop. And then you would go over here and you would click delete resource group, which I'm not gonna do because I need it, but you don't need it. For everyone else, let's click in our resource group and go check out what we built or what we, what we imported and Azure built for us. So again, we go to resource groups over here and then we click on our DevSlop workshop resource group. And I'm gonna put you guys over here. Maybe actually I'll put you at the top. There we go. So in here you can see we put a whole bunch of stuff. We put an application gateway, a public IP address, an application gateway, another public IP address, some solutions, a virtual network, an app service plan. So that's how much you wanna pay. A log analytics workspace, an SQL server, good. An SQL database, good. A storage account, which is a place where we store all of our logs. And then an app service. So let's click on our app service. So you can see scenario SQL in injection attack prevention. Here you can see all the information about this one specific resource. If we click or if we scroll down here on the left, there will be an area for security. Where is it? Monitoring. Did they move stuff again? Settings, deployment. Oh, this is good. So there's monitoring here. Did I mention they changed things on me? <laughs> Interesting, app service plan, tool deployment, web push settings. Okay, so let's go look, for starters, let's look at the app that we're running. So we can click this, the URL right here and it should open a new browser window. So if your database worked correctly and deployed correctly, you should have this. Does anyone have it? <laughs> You're like, hope so. Okay, so we're gonna come back here and we're gonna look at this just for a second. I wanna show you one thing, because we're here and we're in the app service. I wanna show you how to force HTTPS on the server. So if we look at TLS SSL settings, see how it says HTTPS only and it's off? You just click the on button and then you wait a few seconds and then it's on. Azure will create your own cert for you, your own certificate, as long as you're not having a custom domain name if you're going to have a custom domain name, you need to get your custom domain and register it and then get a certificate with your custom domain name and then put it in here. We don't give those out by default, so you have to go get one, but there's lots of cool services that do that and some of them are free, but this isn't a talk on that. But anyway, I'm a big fan of forcing HTTPS only Francisca and I have talked a lot about that on the show already, so I will try really hard not to dive down that rabbit hole. So let's go look at our security center again here on the left. So in the gray part, the green shield, for you it might be near the bottom unless you've moved it up to the top by dragging it. So let's click on that. And then let's look at the different parts. And I'm gonna move you over here again. Actually, I might make you two disappear for a second. Is that okay? I'm sorry. It's just, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna put you down here until later. So if we look at this resource, uh, we look at the security center, we can see a few things, right? So in the overview, there's three main sections and this is the stuff that I'd really like you to know. So there's policy and compliance, resource security hygiene, and then threat protection. So the thing I'd like us to look at right now is threat protection. So if you could all click on here. So you will likely not have anything in here, 
because you just created your um, your instance. So no offense, nothing good's happened to you because you've only existed a few hours. So likely you do not have a whole bunch of things here like I do. As you can see, I have a whole bunch of things. So possible incoming SQL brute force attempts detected. So that doesn't look good. Traffic from unrecommended IP address was detected. Hmm, I wonder what countries those came from. Unusual amount of data extracted from storage account. Well, that sounds pretty bad. <laughs> I should probably look at that. Even though we just have publicly available data in our database, that's obviously not ideal. And so then if we look again, possible incoming SQL brute force attempts detected. So this is good actually, because I ran workshops on those days, but let's look at yours. And I would like people to tell me if anyone has anything here to see and if so, what it was. Um, so I can just see one of you now. Nancy, did anyone comment if they have anything in their security alerts? No. I just see those are newer alerts from storage ATP. Okay. And, and what does it say? What does the description say? No details yet. Uh, and then on Mixer. So I have nothing in threat protection, which is normal since it was created 20, 30 minutes ago. Perfect. I don't have any. Okay, so let's put some in there. <laughs> so I'm gonna minimize you again. And let's all go back to our app service that we opened. So hopefully everyone got their app service opened. If people need me to explain how to do that again, actually, I'll just show you. So you go into your portal, you click on resource groups, you go to your resource group. So that is DevSlop Workshop for us. Then you look through your resources and you go to the very bottom and it's called app service. You click on that app service and then you go to the URL of your application. So see URL, you click there and it will launch the Contoso Clinic. Oh, the Contoso Clinic has so many security problems all the time. They are our demo company that we do so many security attacks against. So if we click on patients, I'm clicking, it's not going well. I'm clicking and nothing's happening. Oh no, did mine not work? There we go. Okay, so we click on patients and then it actually shows up. I guess we have to be kind of patient, not my specialty. So we are going to do an SQL injection attack against this. Now, this is not an AppSec workshop. And so the work of figuring out what a good attack would be is a really good lesson, but that's not what I wanna teach you today because we will do that for the next hour instead of investigating the incident, which I consider to be more on topic. So I'm gonna click on SQL hints and then I'm gonna copy and paste one of them into the field and click search. So I want all of you to do that too and make sure that it worked. I think the first hint actually doesn't even work, which is really funny. Because we want to trigger some alerts. Ooh, this does not look very good. I'll have to report that bug because it's not actually supposed to crash. Um, and then last one. And then we get a bunch of things. So now we have officially attacked our web app, right? This is not good, correct? Was everyone able to look at the hints and copy them into the input, the search field and then press the search button and then get various results that look like you got things you're not supposed to? I got a, it's, it's slow, but it works. And yeah, somebody actually just got an email alert. Nice. Yes. Awesome. My poor friend, Anthony, I turned on Azure Security Center and he was giving a demo of this, but like to show security vulnerabilities and then Azure blocked him 
and told on him and called him and he's like my my demo failed i'm like are you kidding your demo sounds awesome because <laughs> it told you not to and it stopped you it protected you but anyway he's friends with me anyway which is good okay so let's go not there so let's go to back here and then let's go look in security center so let's click on the left on our green beautiful shield with the lock on security center on the left here i'm going to just make this bigger to make sure everyone can see and let's go to our threat protection oh no one high severity where did that come from potential sql injection oh no so if everyone could please click on that let's see what awful things you did to your oh no the attacked resource contoso clinic it does have a lot of troubles, that clinic. Count one. Ugh, should have seen two. Maybe it's just waiting to see the second one, or maybe it considers both of those injections part of the attack. Activity time right now. Environment, Azure. State active, severity high. So let's click on it and see more information. So it tells me where, it tells me which subscription. It tells me, um, my alert ID, so it did alert me. Tells me my database that was attacked, which is really good to know. And then it tells me the exact attack. So what I could do is if I have a test database, I could copy and paste this into it and see if I get data. Sometimes people throw a lot of crap at your database, but they don't actually get anything out of it. So an attack was successful, like they did get code through to your database, but the code didn't actually run, right? So this is, um, it's definitely important to test to see what actually happened. So here's the vulnerable statement. So I, thread ID number one, it's the worst one. So defect in application code, constructing faulty SQL statement. So ap application code doesn't properly sanitize user input and was exploited to inject malicious SQL statements. Was this useful? Darn right it was. Oh no, I'm not submitting. I don't have time for that. So <laughs> another thing that you could do is you could write a playbook to have it auto, um, I'm just gonna take that out of there, to have it auto respond to this. That's a thing that you could do. It's not a thing we're gonna do today because again, this would be a full day training and we definitely don't have time for that tonight. At some point we all wanna go to sleep slash Oren wants to start his day. So did everyone have a chance to see that and find that? Because we're, we should be happy that we found, we've, oh, your unsaved edits, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Got two people on Twitch that can't seem to see any alerts. No security alerts, not seeing, it. oh, just got it. Just got it, perfect. Got it, yeah. I'm concerned I only saw one because I would like to see two from that, to be quite honest because I did two attacks. However, I guess it's like you are under attack, so you should just, like your app is vulnerable. It's the same app if it was a different app and they're within like a couple seconds of each other, but I'd still, maybe like ideally one day we could report like the two separate statements or maybe it's just taking time to figure itself out. Hmm. If you leave this open for a while, which if it's a trial, that's okay to do, but if it is a real system, it is not okay to do. You might see all sorts of fun things show up in here. Um, when I first started at Microsoft, one of the other advocates, his name is Damien, and he's really awesome. He had created uh, this little, uh, a server that was outside of the firewall and network, just off on its lonesome, that was a dev, just like a little dev demo that he'd forgotten about. And someone was trying to manually brute force the server uh, for four months this, from the same IP address. And I started referring to whoever was doing that as his little friend. I'm like, oh, your little friend is back. And sometimes, you know, the person would go away for a week, but then they would come back and sit there and like just manually try to hack into his box. And I found it absolutely hilarious that after months and months, the person just gave up and they never got in. Um, that person probably isn't really a very qualified black hat, um, but 
we could tell right away that it was happening, but because we figured out there's nothing on it, and then it would it was great because then there'd always be all these awesome things to look at in my account, which is like really good for demo purposes. We just left it. But anyway, let's go back to Security Center Overview. So this is really important and you would obviously have it set so that it emails you or calls you if something this serious is happening because I do demos, I don't do that. You would check this every day. If something is low, you still wanna check it out. You can train Azure to stop reporting those things over time if you know that they're okay. So for instance, um, I log in from uh, like all the time from the VPN for work. So it recognizes, you know, that I'm going to be at one of those spots. But if I log in from like a hotel Wi-Fi or something, it won't let me in. It's like, I can tell something's wrong. Why isn't your VPN turned on? So you can train it to do things and that's cool. The next thing I want to look at is policy and compliance. I know what you're thinking. Ooh, compliance policy. That's sexy. Well, it kind of is. <laughs> Oren, were you going to say something? I feel like you're, no, it's okay. <laughs> no comment. Is, is he making faces? Because it's important that, good. <laughs> making Oren smile is fun. Okay, so why are policy and compliance kind of fun in the cloud? So previously, uh, I used to work at places where we did compliance on paper. So the security person would have a checklist that was on paper and they would come and they would ask me a bunch of questions. And then I was a developer and I like, I would like to say I always told the truth, but sometimes I wouldn't know and I'd say, yeah, I did that. Or I was going to do something next week and I'd say, yeah, I did that. <laughs> and you would get this snapshot that is based on the honesty system of people who are good at developing software or maintaining operation, uh, maintaining servers, answering it, who aren't security experts. And then they would check off boxes and then there would be a report at the end of how compliant you were. But now, instead, we can automate those things. So for instance, if you use ISO 27001, you can click on that and then you can see how compliant you are to all of the things. So we failed 84, we skipped one, so I'm not sure what that's about, and we passed 250. So what this means is you have an up-to-date list of what you are and are not compliant with, which is really cool. They also have the CIS, um, the CIS benchmarks, which are pretty cool. It does not have the complete CIS benchmarks yet, as far as I know, um, but it has 25 of them, which is pretty cool and it goes through and it automatically tells you what you are or are not compliant with. Is it gonna go there? Is it just, nope. Just, oh, there we go, I see. So we look at, so install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data, yeah. So if we were PCI, um, we would have failed big time. So if we, if we look at this, like we are in deep water. So no one should give the DevSlop team their credit card numbers, okay? <laughs> Just PayPal, send donations. Yeah, actually send us donations. <laughs> we should show that at the end, Nancy, the, how they can send us donations. And then we will use your money to pay to um, add. Be PCI compliant. Probably not. We'll probably yeah. actually just use it to add captions at the bottom for people that are hearing impaired so to make sure they're accurate. I know that's not as exciting as accepting your credit card numbers. But yeah, so I think that this is pretty cool. That makes compliance actually a lot more possible. Uh, they're adding more to that all the time. Um, and then another thing is security score. Um, so previously I used to work on security teams at various places. And one of them I remember, my boss would only see me when he was pissed off because there was an incident. And the rest of the time he wouldn't see me. So then he wouldn't know we were doing awesome stuff. And sometimes just because you're having an incident doesn't mean you're not doing a good job. Like I started a job once and the first week I reported an incident and the next week I reported a few incidents and then I just kept reporting things. And one day my boss turned to me and she's like, we never had any security incidents until you got here, which I responded was actually, you've been having these forever. This place is burning down. You just didn't know. 
but I said it nicer. We're friends, just to be clear, I'm respectful of my bosses. But the point is, is that um, when you have a security score, this is a thing that you could show your boss where you're doing a good job, but it's not during an incident. So you could say, so we look at the score, so you get certain points for doing the right thing. So we're going to look at my subscription and we see, so I have seven high severity things that it wants me to do so that I could get a perfect score, two medium and four low. So if we look at it, the number one thing every single person should do is turn on multi-factor authentication. I turned it off so I could demo this and also because it's just a demo account and that's all I do are demos. There's actually no real actual company data in my account. No, 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 because there would be MFA on it. Um, the other thing is, so it goes through and it talks about different points. And the reason why you get different points is to show you what high level of, what priority level it is. So 50 points is obviously a lot. We really want you to turn on multi-factor authentication, especially if it is a higher level subscription that controls other subscriptions. This is the keys to your kingdom. Mm. So you really, I know that I lecture, but it's really important to me that people implement that. And so the point of the secure score is that you can see the score going up. And so you can show your boss, hey, guess what? I know we didn't have any incidents this month, so you might not realize what we were doing and why you keep paying us, but you can see our score went from like 541 to 600 because we knocked out a whole bunch of these things. And you know, you should be proud of us. Right? Like, this is why you keep paying us. Um, I like the idea of being able to show my boss value without there being a huge emergency. So personally, I find, I've had a lot of people say like we shouldn't gamify things, but for me, I find it very useful. Okay, so the last thing in policy compliance is subscription coverage. So usually there's not only two subscriptions, usually there's a whole bunch of subscriptions, but like I said, my boss won't let me act like the entire team's security team um, and <laughs> to not run around peering into the subscriptions of my colleagues, which is reasonable. Um, so I can just see these two, but you can see immediately, so we're fully covered, two of two. So there's none that are partially covered, there's none that are not covered. If you are in an enterprise, you will likely have many, many subscriptions and being able to see immediately how many things are covered and that you have complete coverage is so, so valuable. Um, it can take up to five to 10 minutes to see if something has been turned on. So if you turn on Azure Security Center and one second later it's not showing, it's okay, go have a coffee, come back, it'll be fine. It's because Azure wants to go and test for itself that it actually worked. Um, I know that there's a delay and it can be really frustrating. If you knock off some of the recommendations or fix things, Azure needs to run another VA scan and make sure that it's actually completed. And so that delay is sort of on purpose, even though it can be annoying because you, because I like to see my stuff immediately improve. Okay, so the last part of this I wanna talk about are recommendations. So I want everyone to click on the recommendations tab, please. I know that we saw this before in the secure score, but um, I wanted to show it to you again because this is the best part of Azure Security Sensor in my opinion. So what it does is it looks at your subscription and it does all these VA scans and it reviews your configuration and it does all these things automatically and then our team of experts who actually built Azure, all of those security people worked together to make this list of a prioritized list of activities for you to do to secure your subscription. And it's kind of amazing. So you can break it down by computers and apps, data and storage, identity and access resources, networking resources, or you can just look at most points to least points. So I'm just gonna move this over here to where the colors are. So for instance, like a maximum of three owners should be designated for your subscription. And that's for Microsoft Ignite the Tour because it takes a lot of us to run the tour, more than three people. Um, and I realize everyone doesn't need to be an owner, but we have a lot of chains of management and we're doing it all over the world, some of them at the same time. So we have agreed to accept that risk of having more than three owners. That's okay. 
Um, so another one near the bottom is, you know, diagnostics logs in Event Hub should be enabled. Yeah, I should turn that on. But it costs money, and I was like trying to... <laughs> I know I work for Microsoft, but I have a certain amount of bill I'm allowed to do, like I'm allowed to have per month, and I want to turn on literally everything, and apparently that's inappropriate, because I'll just build these giant things, and so I'm trying to watch my bills. So sometimes I turn things off and on again, because they're just for demos. Um, so the top one here, like we talked about, was multi-factor authentication. For your subscriptions, we need you to turn that on. It suggests here um, a vulnerability assessment solution should be installed on your virtual machines. That's if you don't accept the one the Azure Security Center is doing for you. You want a second opinion. So you want to install Nessus, Nexpo, something like that. I get it that you might want to do that. I don't know, it's a lot of money. You are allowed to, so let's say you don't like that one. What you can do is you can open it and then you can dismiss it. So let's say on DevSlop DCheck, or so these, that's the only one that's mine, so I don't wanna remove things. So I'm gonna dismiss this one. Dismiss recommendations fail, please try again later. No, I'm doing a demo. Please make me look good, Azure. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll dismiss a different one. It'll be great. Um, so the next one is vulnerabilities in security configuration on your machine should be remediated. So let's click on that. So there's one virtual machine, and it appears that this machine stinks. <laughs> so I haven't patched Azure uh, Dev, um, DevSlop DCheck in... When did I create it, Nancy? Because I haven't... I haven't bothered since then. <laughs> I don't know. It makes for great demos. <laughs> um, so if you look through all of these things, there's a whole bunch of different settings, and I feel like this would be a good workshop, just working through all of these live one day. I don't want to do it now because it's almost 9 p.m., but like just working through and fixing all of these one by one I think would be a really great idea. Like, Do not allow passwords to be saved. Right, so do not allow passwords to be saved is set to enabled. So ensure that it is set to enabled. You probably don't want passwords saved uh, into browsers. I advise against that personally. Instead, I feel that we should all use uh, password managers. If you have a team, having a team password manager is great because that means if one of you quits, everyone's not locked out of everything, potentially, like if there's shared resources. It's really good. Um, so this will tell you all the things down to the like specific level. So it's telling me I have 66 critical, which is obviously like pretty bad. But then 28 are warnings and one's informational. So I feel like a warning should not be that scary looking. Like maybe that should be like blue or green and then failed by rule type. So my registry keys are not good. Okay, fine, I get it. You don't like me, it's fine. <laughs> so the next one is an Azure Active Directory administrator should be provisioned for um, SQL servers. I guess that's true. I don't have one set. Abel and I are just the owners. And that's a bad idea because if Abel and I both decided to quit at the same time, then we would have no administrator for that box. But I trust Abel. Secure transfer to storage accounts should be enabled. That's a really good one. Vulnerability assessment should be enabled on your SQL servers. Hey, that is enabled on my server. Which servers are you talking about? This is enabled here. What are you talking about? Let's go look. Yeah, advanced data security on. Oh, periodic reoccurring scans. It was off. Well, let's turn it on. So no, let's do it to my Microsoft account. Um, send email notifications to admins and subscription owners. No advanced threat protection settings. Send alerts to me. Okay, so that makes sense why I didn't get that alert. Let's save this. And then actually let's turn on some advanced threat protection. Let's do that. I don't know, Nancy, do you think that we get, so I'm now, how about everyone go with me and let's go to our database server and let's turn on some threat protection. So everyone go to your resource group because obviously you were doing everything else with me as well, right? 
So let's all go to our resource group and then let's all go to our dev slop workshop. So again, resource groups on the left here, second from the top or third from the top and then dev slop workshop. And we're gonna click on it and we're gonna see all of our fantastic stuff. And we're going to go look through here for our SQL server. So SQL injection server, it's a great name. And we're gonna click on it. And in here on the left, so we call this a blade. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in various blades. And we're gonna to go to the security area and click on advanced data protection. So again, we're in our database server. We're down in the security area. We click on advanced data security. And so it's on. Oh, it's on already. That's less exciting. So hopefully, I guess it's on for all of you too by default then. That makes this a lot less exciting. So we have a subscription. So let's assign a storage account to it so that it can save this in. So let's click the storage account button. And then I believe we have a storage account called SQL Injection. So click that one. In case that was too fast, I'm just gonna click on this again. So we click storage account. You should have exactly one and it should say SQL Injection STG something, something, something. And so we're gonna click that one. Periodic reoccurring scanning. If you were doing this permanently, you should do this. You should turn this on. Again, this is a subscription. Uh, this is a trial, so we're just trying it out. So we would turn this on, but if anyone is using their work email, please don't turn this on unless you have permission from your boss. <laughs> I know I'm giving a lot of warnings, but I really don't like people to get the wrong idea about things. But I'm gonna turn this off actually, because it's more fun. Um, so advanced threat protection settings. So send alerts to dummy at contoso.com, which is great. And let's look at the advanced threat protection types. So if we click here, it's gonna bring us over. And so we have selected all. So if you unselect it, it unselects them. And then you can say, oh, I just want one type, but you want all of them. I can't see anyone ever saying, you know what? I don't really want to know about all the risks. I just want to know about some. But for whatever reason, we've, we've added that option. But what it looks for, so this is not the same as a WAF. This is not a web app firewall. This is only protection against specifically your SQL database, your Microsoft SQL database. This does not work on other types of databases. This is specific to our products. And it will look for if an SQL injection attack is happening, if you're vulnerable to it, if it appears that data exfiltration is occurring, if there's unsafe actions, what does that mean? I don't know, it's vague, so that we can keep adding more things that we view as unsafe and continue to scan for those things. And then anomalous client login, and what that means is suspicious logins, like, oh, we don't know that person, why'd that person log in? Or, Tanya was in Paris and now appears, apparently she's also in um, South America. One hour later, how did that happen? That would be suspicious. So we're gonna click okay. And then again, we need storage details because see how it has this little caution sign there? So let's configure our storage details. So we see, and then we're like, oh, we have no retention days. Well, that's not gonna work, right? So let's set our retention days to um, approximately two years. Well, just under two years. And storage key access. So switching between storage keys should be done to secure completeness of the audit logging while regenerating new storage account keys. So this is a more advanced thing. We don't need to do this at this point, but we should rotate keys. Um, we are adding all sorts of new features all the time, including a way to use Key Vault to auto-rotate these keys. I believe um, one of the Microsoft teams released a proof of concept for this, which is really cool. And uh, I shared it before, I'll have to share it again. But basically, um, where you can have Azure Functions rotate the keys for you regularly, which is, I think, an awesome idea. So let's click OK on this, and then let's click Save and it's saving for us. 
hopefully it's actually saving. All right, saved. So we have now added advanced data security to our database. Yes, we're amazing, correct? Correct. <laughs> I do have a question. Perfect. Um, it says, I could see, um, will security center alert on key vault abuse? That was for previously. Ooh, that's such a good question. So it would depend on what you define as key vault abuse. So for everyone that doesn't know what key vault is, so we have a key vault, actually, let me just show you our key vault. Um, resource groups, uh, dev slot patty, and in here we have a key vault. Our key vault, key vault is a secret store. There's a bunch of types of different products that do that, like truffle hog, um, or a giddy, um, anyway, I'm not going to bother to name a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch Archie and... Carp. Pardon? Harshi Carp, I think. Yes! That's a good one, Vault by Hershey Corp. So basically you store your secrets there and secrets can be like literally a secret, a certificate, keys, a username password combo, which are known as credentials, right? So you can see here, we have no keys. We do have one secret and it's a connection string and it does not show it to you because it is, <laughs> it's keeping our secrets. Um, and we do not have our certificate stored in here. I know, shame on us. Anyway, it's on our list of things to do <laughs> in our open source project. Um, you can also actually add locks to things so that resources can't be changed. And again, that's like a lesson, I guess, for another day. But the idea of a secret store is you put your secrets in there and then you access them programmatically via APIs. And so you don't actually have to manage your secrets yourself. It manages it it manages them for you. And so if someone's attacking Key Vault directly, like your Key Vault should never have a public face to it. So my Key Vault is spoken to by my app, like my app calls its API. And then I also have another one where my Azure DevOps instance calls it. Um, so I, like I have a, a DevOps pipeline and in it, it accesses so I have my key vault attached to it and I've authorized it and then it goes in and it gets values and it takes them out and then plugs them in as you're doing your pipeline so that it has the passwords to all the things. So I don't know how it would be abused. Like I'm not saying it's not possible. It's just I'm not familiar with that scenario. scenario. Yeah, so if, yeah. if that person could describe a scenario that would really help me and I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm sure someone's gonna prove me wrong. But, but you should definitely never have a public IP for your secret store. Um, people should access it via the APIs and I can administer it only from my subscription and then Abel has access to it as well because he's on our project team and then no one else can see it because no one else should. And um, if we look at, let's look at our access control. So if we look at our access control, we can see that, let's look, because I made a service principle. So contributor, able, and then I have an automation thing set up. Then, so I have more than one account because I'm weird, so I have a SheHacks purple, and then I have a TA Janka as well. Um, so then I also have a management group contributor, security orchestration, and then owner, able, and then security admin, me reader so we have analytics readers um, so i have a lot of monitoring set up and then user access administration so i added um pim oh orin this is one of those things where you'll know it better than me so privileged identity management i believe this is called and i always mess this up is orin still there or did he go to sleep no he's there he's, he's here. nodding i'm nodding i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> oh okay sorry i couldn't see you because I'd, I'd hidden the two of you because I keep moving you around the screen and it's it's kind of, it's weird to just move your friends around a screen. Anyway. This is why you need multiple laptops, Tanya. Then you can have it all on that laptop and then you got your presentation laptop there. You know, that's really smart. Um, I do have another monitor, but it's uh, in a box right now, but I will get it out in a few weeks. And um, then what I can do is I could have you two on another sc screen or, even better, um, cheater things on the other screen, like the answers. <laughs> I 
I'm bad, but it's true. That's okay. Um, oh, and then I can just so share you my came back with an abuse example. Oh, okay. yes. Use a certificate where it it's not sh supposed to be. It should not be. Hmm. So, like someone attempting to call the API to get access to the certificate when they shouldn't, or someone in the Azure portal trying to access the certificates themselves through the actual key vault in the portal, like I am here, or. Um, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm like I'm not uh, definitely by far an expert on certificates. I know they're good. I know I need them. I know we and at, and a couple other places give them away for free. Other places charge. I know you got to get new ones every so often, whether you like it or not. That's it. Yeah. But another interesting question that Oren answered on them. Um, on YouTube was uh, can you create your own compliance policies like uh, the example that was given is VM should have certain AV software installed or, or specific conf configuration specific services running etc so Oren said not yet <laughs> but stay tuned so I think it's something that's coming but that would be definitely interesting because you were comparing them to the CIS mm -hmm. and uh, frameworks that were already there but if we can build our own that would definitely be interesting Yes, you know what would be really exciting us Canadian citizens is if, you know, so I'm an ex-GC Government of Canada employee and uh, Nancy wrangles their risk regularly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to say it like in the like most like yeah, way possible. Um, and imagine if you could put ISG um, 22 or 33 into a policy and then just flip it on, right? And then the government could issue that policy as a template to everyone. And then every single department that chooses Azure as their cloud could just flip that on and know immediately what is and is not compliant. Could you imagine how much easier your life would be? You just go into Azure, you're like, nah, ah. Mm -hmm. You print out laundry lists for them. They're like. <laughs> and obviously multi-factor authentication would be number one on your subscription. Other ways, but yeah, yeah. So those I found interesting, but no more questions. Cool. Let's go back to Security Center for a bit and look at the recommendations just for another second. I just want to read the other ones that are there. There are so many more that you're not seeing here. So they've started adding application security related ones, like you have cores set to star. Um, so. Nancy and I on Sunday on the show were trying to implement content security policy, the security header with a nonce because we had it set so it was so strict that we couldn't run our own JavaScript in our own app so that we could had so that we could have a privacy header on our website. So we wanted to add a nonce so that it could see just that one script and run that every time. However, we failed, but that's okay, we'll get it. Um, but the point is, is if you have cores set to star, that's you saying, run any script you want. It's cool. It's not cool. It's awful. <laughs> um, you don't want to have lots of scripts from anywhere be able to be run on your website. And the reason for this is that that is the first thing a hacker will do if they can. They will try to call code from somewhere else to execute in your site that's bigger and worse. So this is the type of uh, warning that you can get here, but we are not getting it because we fixed all of the AppSec things right away. Another one is, you know, if you're using an old version of PHP or Node.js, it will tell you you should plan for upgrading and other things like that. Um, yeah, so I guess there's like a, for instance, your machine needs to be restarted in order to apply some system updates. Yeah, I know, it's off. So I have to turn it on and off again <laughs> in order to get those actual updates to work. And then a bunch of these other ones will disappear, but I do have some patching to do. This is the part where I would like the audience to tell us if they have anything that they would like us to go over. So please put in the chat if there's specific questions that you have, and then I'm just gonna go over the security of each one of these things a bit at a time for the next little while. And if we have no questions, then we will wrap up. We do have some slides to wrap up. Don't just hang up on us. <laughs> um, so I have uh, Borco uh, mm -hmm. on 
You can hear me? Okay. If security policy requires that IAS, IAS, VMs block outbound traffic to public internet, can you use Azure Security Center? It seems agent requires forwarding rules for outbound traffic enabled, or am I wrong? I don't know. This is definitely an Oren question. Can you see it? It's on the YouTube or oh, I'm going to check mine too. Um, your better way of doing that would be to use something like Azure Firewall and set up Azure Firewall rather than doing it on the VM. So what you do is you'd have your virtual network and you'd have your VM sitting up to your virtual network. You'd uh, configure a route, you'd push it through Azure Firewall and then you'd simply block uh, all outbound traffic from those VMs uh, rather than doing it within the VM itself. So you wouldn't limit the communication within the VM itself, although, um, I mean, you could come up with a firewall rule, you could come up with a way of assessing that, but uh, the better way to do that um, or implement that would be to basically go and push in as your firewall, have a particular virtual network, uh, configure the routing cable on that network to push all traffic that was outbound from that virtual network through Azure Firewall and then just um, limit things that way. I have a question in mine. So it said playbook's not available. So I'm assuming that that means that this behavior, it can't trigger a playbook on it because it's not quite sure how to recognize it. Because I know certain things you can write a playbook for and it says, oh, do you want to write a playbook for this? And then other ones it doesn't. So for instance, if we go into Security Center and then we go down to show us all the stuff that happened, some of these will offer the ability to see, um, to write a playbook and other ones won't. So track traffic from a recommended, an unrecommended IP. So track resource or any of these mine, of course they're not. So let's look up Sao Paulo tour because that should have been deleted a long time ago. And so it says, you know, Azure Security Center has detected incoming traffic from an IP address that has been identified as bad. It's low, it's from Microsoft the tour. What are the things, was this useful, yes or no? Investigation not available, playbooks not available. Interesting. Missing workspace permissions. Oh, maybe that's because it's been deleted since then. Or maybe I don't have permission to look at that. That's interesting. Let's look at some more of these and see not available. So these are all the exact same type of one. Hmm. So let's look at other security alerts. So login from unusual Azure data center, Tailwind Traders, Anthony Chu. And uh, oh, again, not an option. Geo and threat intelligence information. Interesting. I am used to getting like a lot of options to create playbooks, which is why I thought I wanted to start making them. Possible incoming SQL brute force attempted MS SQL server. Ooh, this looks good, Oren. <laughs> so network traffic detected incoming SQL communications to there associated with your resource. When the compromised resource is a load balancer, an application gateway, the suspected incoming traffic has been forced to one or more of the resources in the backend pool. Medium detected. And again, no options. I'm c and of course, it's part of Microsoft Ignite the Tour because they're all demos. So remediation steps. Find the suspicious machine. Yep. Geo and threat intelligence information. I am so surprised. Shocked. Um, so let's look at other security alerts. Access from an unusual location to storage. Ignite the tour. Again, not available. I wonder if we have to do the remediation before we're allowed to, because usually it does allow me to investigate things, like it used to, anyway. I feel like um, I'm only supposed to show Azure when it looks cool, and this isn't, ooh! E this is us, Nancy. EXE application control policy violation was audited. Uh, what does that mean? Did so, we do? It sounds bad. So the below user ran executables that are violating the application control policy of your organization on this machine. Oh, I set up application um, whitelisting. 
Yeah, and it was supposed to, and it was supposed to tell me if anything other than Zap ran. Uh, and so something, so path, so what ran? Okay, so active, it happened Wednesday quite a while ago, subscription me. So target user, NT authority network service, hit count one. I'm hiding you again. So node.js foundation. Oh, so it's updating node. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so, but, but look, it's an invest. Let's investigate. Yeah. <laughs> Investigation dashboard preview. This is great. We get to actually do something. All right. Um, so this is a really cool thing. Uh, so I'm going to hide you two again for a second. Sorry. Let's put you up there. Um, this is, I don't know. I think this is really cool. I'm a nerd. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but look at all the cool stuff you can see. So we can see the investigation. So we can see that it was our deep. So we only have one virtual machine. Everything else is on app service, which is platform as a service. So the NT authority network service unrelated. So to incident unrelated, I don't understand basic information. Okay. So EXC application control policy was violated because I told it it was allowed to run zap. And I think that that was all it was allowed to run. So the blow user, so it's just telling me the things that we already knew. Okay. Related things. Remediation step. Review the list of executables that were ran. Yeah. Review the application control policy. So clearly I have to add um, them updating to the list. Review the, or do I want them to do that without my permission? Review the list of existing rules on each of the rule collections. In case you wish to allow them and change the application control policy applied to this machine policy, make sure to add them to the appropriate rules that you have identified in step number three. Um, so the reason why we do application waitlisting, it's usually on servers. And the idea is, is that only the thing that should be running on your server should be running. And if other things are running, they're probably malware, right? And so if every exe or something that tries to start is immediately, you know, the process is killed, then that means malware wouldn't be able to run, theoretically, unless it names itself the same thing. And we know that malware is bad, so it tries to do that. However, it doesn't mean that it will get one of the very few things that we have approved on our server. So if the above executables are not currently allowed by one of the rules that you have identified in step three, and in this case you wish to allow them, adjust your rule policy. So let's look at playbooks. How do you use playbooks in investigation? So we are not going to do, we're not going to make a playbook today. There's no way we have enough time. And also I've never made one before and it's probably smarter if I do one by myself and then I show all of you. But That's again, another show. It is another oh. show. But and look at Oren's face. I feel like he's like, no, don't do that. Oh, let me look <laughs> at Oren's face. There he is. Yeah, that, see? No. Okay. He was shaking his head like, mm. <laughs> not a great idea. I think no, that's there's more, you know, there's certain things you admit, there's certain things you don't admit. You go, oh, I don't think we have time to do a playbook. You don't say, I've never done that before. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Soon. So you leave that. You leave that as a mystery, and then you come back, and then you do it, and then, you know. That's so anti death slot, though. <laughs> I know. We're allowed to make mistakes. Nancy said so. <laughs> Sloppy DevOps. Sloppy DevOps, that's us, folks. So I feel that unless we have more questions, I'm going to check. Okay, so OWASP, okay, so OWASP Dev Slop, hobby stand topics. What's your thoughts on Azure Security Toolkit compared to Azure Security Center for checking Azure Security configurations? Ah, so who wrote that? Because the name is OWASP underscore dev slop. Yeah, that's me okay. pasting questions from elsewhere to you. So okay, you perfect. Because I was like, it makes me feel uncomfortable if someone else that isn't us made one named us. No, no, <laughs> it's me. That, that's cool. Um, so the Azure DevOps security kit, 
will run in your pipeline and it will check things at that exact moment in time. And it only runs when your pipeline runs. And it's great, they'll tell you a bunch of things that are wrong. However, if that's your only time that you check, and so I remember seeing presentations by Etsy and they publish 100 times a day. So maybe that would work great for them because they would see a problem instantaneously. However, for me, I don't feel that that, like, when do we publish, Nancy? When we feel like putting out a new feature, we feel like doing a show. So that mm -hmm. means that all sorts of crap, all sorts of stuff could be going to hell in a handbasket and we would have no idea because we weren't running regular VAs and we weren't using Security Center regularly to check in. So you have to run things through your pipeline to see it. I'm also not sure if it actually shows the exact same things, if it, um, if it has the same number of tests or the same tests. I know that it reports a lot of the same things, but I'm not sure if it's the exact same. Also, um, you can't really, I don't believe you can set a policy in it. You just sort of run it, and then it just tells you a bunch of stuff that's wrong or not wrong, and then that's sort of it. So, I don't know. Yeah. So those are my comments. Oren, would you like to add comments? Not particularly. I think that you covered it as well as I could. I mean, I'm not as familiar with the DevOps toolkit as you are, so. Cool. Okay, so the other question from Hobby Stand Topics is, can you guys speak to getting logging of alerts out of Azure and into a SIM? And it's at or in, yes. <laughs> so I guess that's a question for you, Oren, specifically. Um, it depends on how you do it. Um, certainly with uh, Sentinel, uh, there's some documentation on how to configure it in terms of uh, getting stuff up, although um, I've heard of some people having a few challenges around it because this, of course, Sentinel, I still think is in public preview, uh, and especially when people were trying to do stuff on-prem. Um, so a lot of the challenges are more in, around how do you get stuff around firewall rules and how do you get telemetry in and out, uh, and that's where things start to become a little more complicated, and at the moment I don't think all the documentation is necessarily there yet in terms of how you do those sort of things. So it might be really fun to get it working. Third party tools, right? I get it though, I get it. Um, okay, so if there aren't any more questions, I feel like maybe we should do the wrap up here because there are a few slides and I also want to show everyone how to shut down all their stuff and not receive a surprise bill. It's a good idea. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to, so briefly we're gonna see one or two slides. So, Windows slideshow from the slide. Can you see this? It's okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we did a lot of the things in the workshop. Oh, we didn't turn on just in time, damn it. No, 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 okay. So things you may have missed. Um, oh no, we did those things. Okay. So there's a bunch of other labs. So these slides are on the internet. So you can go get them. They're almost the exact same. I've added a few more cute cuddly raccoons, but everything else is the same. So these labs are all going to be in the slides and you can get the slides link uh, at the end of this. So. Special thanks to this GitHub user for creating all four of these um, ARM templates. I don't know who this person is, but thank you. You're awesome. I really appreciate you making them and making them work. That's really great. Sharing things with the community is awesome because that's how we started this workshop. Without them, it would have been a lot harder. So thank you. Okay, so workshop cleanup. You can choose to delete everything right now or you can turn off all your virtual machines and turn everything off and stop everything so that it stops using those things and then you can turn them on again when you want to play with it again. You are responsible, just a second, I'm gonna hide you there. You are responsible for all of your expenses that you run up after this workshop. So again, I just, I don't want anyone to have surprises. My friend Imran Mohammed runs a lot of DevSecOps workshops and He's very cautious on this because he had people like build these giant things in AWS and then they didn't close them and then they're very upset because they got huge bills. 
So no one wants you to have a bill that you did not make up. So let's shut everything down together. Okay, so end of show. Let's see how we shut stuff down. So one thing you can do, if you wanna just delete everything and you can install everything again later, is you can just delete your entire, just delete your resource group. And then it deletes everything out of your subscription. Uh, everything that you created as part of this subscription. So this is one thing you can do. I will do this at the end so you can see it. But if you want to keep everything running, I mean, if you want to keep everything so you can turn it on and play with it later, a thing you can do is you can go through and turn off stuff that costs money. So for instance, I'm going to move you to again, sorry, over here. So for instance, um, let's look up, where's, we have a virtual machine in here somewhere. I think we have a virtual machine, maybe we don't. Okay, so let's for instance look at our SQL server. So I believe we can go here, I don't know, we can't stop that. It's the app service. So we can go to our app service, and then we can just stop our app service. So we just say stop. Are you sure you want to stop it? Like this brings your website down, just to be clear. You do not ever want to press this button on a production website, you'll be in trouble. But we want to take it offline, and that's okay. Right? And so then we're not building up a bill because we're not using it. Anything that you are able to press the stop button on, you stop. I don't believe most of the other ones have a stop button. I think it's just app services and virtual machines. But let's just go through just to be sure. No, I don't think a public IP would have that, an application gateway. So we already looked at one of those, public IP, no solution. I don't think this, nope, no stop button. So basically, if you just stop all the things, that means it can't do anything, right? I'm pretty sure none of the rest of these, so the app service plan, so we've paused our app service, log analytics workspace, that's okay, server, database, can we stop the database? Nope. And storage account, I don't think so, nope. Okay, so for this one, just stop your app service. If you install the other labs, which are, again are linked in the show notes that we'll have, um, you wanna stop all the virtual machines and all the app services so that you don't get a bill for those things while you're not using them. Okay, so let's assume that some people decided that they would just shut off the app service so they would stop spending money. And then now, let's make sure we turn off Security Center. So if you are using your work account, if you are using an account that has anything else in it, and you don't want to use Security Center, and you don't want to pay, I don't want you to pay for things you didn't mean to pay for. I don't think that's cool. So let's look at, um, I think it's Security Policy here. So if, er, no, coverage here, yes. So we go to Security Center on the left with the green shield. We come over to Policy and Compliance and then we click Coverage. And then you click the one that you want and you edit the plan. And you go down to the free tier. So you don't get all these extra things and that's okay. It is much better to have the free version than to have nothing. Um, but just to remind you, so pricing will apply to nine resources in the subscription. I'm not going to turn that off. There's no way I'm going to turn that off. But you would click here and then you would click the save button here. But I'm not going to. And then lastly, if you want to just throw everything away and either start again or you're like, this is enough Azure for me that, you know, completes the trial that I would like to do. So you highlight the resource group that you want to delete, make sure it's the right one, DevSlop Workshop, and click Delete Resource. Then it's going to say we want you to type the name of the resource group, but I'm going to copy and paste because it works. And then I'm going to click Delete. It's going to take a few minutes to delete. You probably want to check back to make sure it actually deleted everything. Sometimes it fails to delete. But again, you can just delete it again, and it generally works the second time. It usually works the first time. But you can go to all resources, and if this is a fresh install, there should be nothing in there when your delete is done. 
Again, you can go to resource groups and see if your resource group is there. Your resource group should disappear. See, mine says deleting already. I always delete this after the workshops because I'm always going to put it back in again later. So if we come back to our slides, start our slideshow again. So we, you can delete everything or you can turn off your virtual machines and your app service until you want to use them again. Last reminder, you're responsible. We shut everything down. Okay, so second last, this is the last one for real. Okay, so now I wanna talk about security being a shared responsibility model. This is very brief. I know that probably your brains are full, but remember Oren was talking about infrastructure as a service. So if we give you a Linux virtual machine or a Windows VM, from that point forward, you need to patch it. Like when we give it to you, it will be in good shape, but from then on, it's your responsibility. So Microsoft's commitment here is physical assets, the database operations, the cloud fabric or infrastructure. And then we provide joint controls for virtual machines, networks, applications, workloads, and data. So there's basically, there's a lot more information about this that you can see here. See at the bottom how there is this link. I think after we should probably like tweet out all the different links from the presentation as well as a link to the presentation just to make sure everyone has a copy of all the links. But this is a Microsoft Learn module where it will explain, my friend Suze is the one in the video, she's awesome. And she'll explain in depth like exactly what is your responsibility and vice versa so that you understand fully. So if this is ever a question, we wanna make sure that you know what you need to do. Okay, so on that note, here are a bunch more Microsoft Learn modules. So Learn is a free platform to learn about Azure. So if you wanna take a screenshot of this, like you may want to, it's up to you. And I can't tell if people have done it or not, so I'm gonna assume that if they wanted to, they did. Of course, we want you to follow our project. Um, we have a Twitter account, which is mostly, um, you know, Nancy and I tweeting about, please watch our show. <laughs> um, and then, you know, this is a link to our YouTube channel where we save all these videos after. I also want to bring to your attention um, that I'm running this little thing on Mondays called Mentoring Monday. Uh, there's no space there. It's all one word, Mentoring Monday with the hashtag. So if you go on Twitter and you are looking for a mentor in InfoSec or other areas of tech or really anything, just use this hashtag on Mondays and say what you're looking for. If I find it, I'll retweet you or you can tag me to make sure I retweet you. I do this every Monday. If you work in security or any area of tech and you have for two years or more, you know enough to teach someone else how to do your job. And right now we are facing a huge skills shortage in security especially, and um, I'm appealing to my community to try to participate in Mentoring Monday by answering people that are looking and pairing off with them and seeing if perhaps there's a book that you can suggest or maybe you could have coffee with them and talk about you know which courses they should take or you know what is a good decision for their next career move our community helping each other is better for everyone there's more than enough jobs for literally every single person um, so I strongly encourage everyone to consider contributing back to our community by mentoring someone Okay, so shamelessly, please follow me. I think I'm cool, so does my mom, and my grandma says I'm okay. <laughs> it's true, I bet my grandma would laugh so hard if she heard that, but anyway. Um, so I'm Sheax Purple on the internet. I would also like it if you would follow our project. Like I said, DevSlop is pretty awesome. <laughs> and these are the slides from the workshop. Please take a screenshot of this. We're gonna share the link after as well from our Twitter account. But these are the slides. It will have all the links in it. Uh, please feel free to share with anyone you want. Um, we wanna share all our knowledge with everyone. And with that, thank you everyone. Thank you, Nancy Garishe. Thank you, Oren Thomas. Thank you, Nikki Becker. Thank you for every single person that attended. We are so happy to have you. We're so happy for you to learn with us on this adventure that we do called OWASP DevSlop. And I'm gonna show everyone's faces again so we can see everything. 
Oh, wait. No, now I just see Nancy. I want to see all of you. I don't know. I broke it, Nancy. I'm sorry. There we go. I'll just go like that. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing, and then we'll see. There we go. Fine. That's better. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're ending ever so slightly early, and maybe that's OK. I feel like two and a half hours is pretty good. Yeah. It's a lot of value. Thank you, Tanya. Oh. Nobody says thank you to you, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> they want to. Actually, that's not true. There's a bunch of thank you very much oh. in the Slack. So I just was not doing my job. Oh, no. <laughs> so yes, a bunch of thank you. Thank you for the two hours of, uh, of knowledge. And thank you, Orin, for replying to the question, the yes. more technical questions in the Slack that was um, in the chat, I mean. Uh, both on uh, YouTube and I was copy pasting yeah. everywhere and making sure we were answering questions. So that was fun. Let's do that again. Yeah, <laughs> we should totally do Sentinel. That would be so cool. I don't know how to use it yet. So first I should figure out how it works. Stop <laughs> saying that. Orange <Orin's> panicking. <laughs> His <laughs> eyebrows are getting higher and higher and higher. What did she say? Well, I don't have hair, so the eyebrows, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only hair left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor, poor Orin. He has poor to work Orin. with me. That's why he has no hair. Mm. No, I lost it a long time ago. But, well, no, I shaved most of it off because it's curly. And I've shown you a picture of what I looked like when I was 18. Um, and so can you imagine all of that, like, curly hair coming out to the sides but being bald on top? I just look stupid. Oh, so just... yeah. No one, no one wants no. that. I Good agree. move. Good, Good move. move. We approve. We approve of this do. Cool. Okay, so perhaps it's time for us to do our customary wave goodbye until next time, and we'll stop the stream. Is everyone ready? We just do like a little wave. We're like, bye, thanks for joining bye, us everyone. on the OWASP Stuff Swap Show.